Başkanı, Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi Acil Tıp Anabilim Dalı ve Başakşehir Çam ve Safura Şehir Hastanesi Acil Tıp Kliniği öğretim üyesi Sayın Doçent Doktor Aynur Şahin'i kürsüye davet ediyorum. Dr. Ayrun Shahin, the head of the scientific committee of our conference and the faculty of both Karadeniz Technical University and Başakşehir Çam and Sakura City Hospital Department of Emergency Medicine to make the first speech. Sayın Acil Sağlık Hizmetleri Genel Müdürüm, Sayın 112 Dairesi ba Daire Başkanım, Sayın Rektörüm, Sayın Dekanım, Sayın Yöneticilerim, Sayın İl Sağlık Müdürüm, e, Değerli Akademisyen Arkadaşlarım, e, Değerli kat Katılımcılar, Hepiniz e, Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi, Emor Üniversitesi İşbirliği ile ilki gerçekleştirilen Uluslararası Tıbbi Toksikoloji Konferansı'na hoş geldiniz. <gülüyor> 11 yıl önce bu salonda Acil asistan olarak oturduğum bu koltuklarda tıbbi toksikoloji yan dalı ve mentorum Doktor Ziyad Kazi ile tanışmam sadece benim değil, benimle birlikte birçok hekimin ve hastanın hayatını tamamıyla değiştirdi. Bu tanışmanın sonrasında başlayan hikayenin her bir aşaması oldukça zordu fakat bir o kadar da anlamlıydı. 2019 yılında Emory'de yan dal eğitimimi tamamladığımda gerçekleştirmek istediğim daha büyük hayallerim ve daha büyük amaçlarım oldu. 2020 yılında kurduğumuz Farabi Hastanesi Tıbbi Toksikoloji Kritik Bakı Ünitesi ve son olarak Başakşehir Çağrı Sakura Hastanesi e, Tıbbi Toksikoloji Yoğun Bakım Ünitesi ile birlikte zehirlenen birçok hastanın hayatına geri dönüşümsüz olarak dokunacağımıza tüm kalbimizde inanıyorum. Yüzyıllar önce Parasalsus'un modern toksikolojinin temellerini attığı noktadan günümüze kadar e, tıbbi toksikoloji zehirlenen hastaların tanısını, tedavisini, yönetimini geliştirerek bilime ve insanlığa hizmet etmektedir. Tıbbi toksikoloji 30 yıldır Amerika Birleşik Devletleri ve Kanada'da acil tıbbın yan dalı olarak kabul edilmektedir ve şu an aktif olarak da Asya, Orta Doğu, Arap Yarımadası'nda tıbbi toksikoloji adına programlar kurulmaya devam etmektedir ve bu konunun uzmanları yetiştirilmektedir. Ülkemizde hali hazırda yan dalı olarak tanınmayan tıbbi toksikolojinin tanınmasında ve tanıtılmasında bu iki üniversitenin işbirliği ve aynı zamanda bu konferansın değeri tartışılmazdır. Bu nedenle ekip arkadaşlarımla birlikte bu konferansın ana temasını yeni bir yandan doğuşu olarak belirledik. Cumhuriyetimizin 100. yılını kutlayacağımız 2023 yılı aynı zamanda Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nde tıbbi toksikolojinin yan dal olarak tanındığı yıl olarak geçmektedir. Bu alana gönül vermiş bir akademisyen e, ve yaşam amacı olarak seçmiş bir hekim olarak tüm dileğim 2023 yılında aynı zamanda tıbbi toksikolojinin yan dal olarak kabul edildiği yıl olmasını tüm kalbimde diliyorum. Konuşmamın sonunda teşekkür etmek istediğim tabii ki çok önemli isimler var. Öncelikle proje ekibimize Emory Üniversitesi'nden başta Profesör Doktor Ziyad Kazi ve Doktor Bülent Morgan olmak üzere tüm Emory ekibine Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi Rektörlüğü, Rektör Yardımcılarımız, Yönetim Kurulu üyelerimize, Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi Tıp Fakültesi Dekanımız, Dekan Yardımcılarımıza ve Fakülte Sekreterimiz Özgür Bey'e, çünkü her aşamada organizasyonu bizimle birlikteydiler. Yine Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi Acil Tıp Anabilim Dalı Öğretim Üyeleri ve tüm asistanlarına, özellikle bu projeyi sürdürürken e, doktor öğretimi Sivirdan Özer ve bizim uzmanımız olan Doktor Nurbanlı Kağıt İngilizce desteklerinden ve dil bariyerini kaldırmasına ötürü teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Onun dışında maddi manevi desteklerinden dolayı Trabzon Ticaret Odası e, Başkanımız Sayın e, Mustafa Suat Hacı Salihoğlu ve Yönetim Kurulu Üyesi Halil Yaroğlu'na verdiği maddi manevi desteklerden ötürü teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Kilometrelerce uzaktan bilimsel katkılarını sunmak için gelen tüm 
e, konuşmacılarımıza, tüm e, moderatörlerimize özellikle teşekkür bir borç biliyorum. E, son olarak organizasyon sekreterisine benimle birlikte gece gündüz durmaksızın çalışan e, öğrenci arkadaşlarımız Mustafa Deniz Tepe, Berkay Yıldız, Melek Üçüncü Oldu, Doktor Öğretimizi Bilgi Tunceli ve diğer tüm öğrenci arkadaşlarımıza teşekkür ederken son teşekkürümü siz katılımcılarımıza değerli katkılarınızdan dolayı bizi desteklediğiniz için teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Sağ olun. Hocamıza konuşması için teşekkür ediyoruz. Şimdi konuşmasını yapmak üzere Emory Üniversitesi Acil Tıp Ana Bilim Dalı Tıbbi Toksikoloji Bilim Dalı Öğretim Üyesi ve Amerikan Tıbbi Toksikoloji Derneği Yönetim Kurulu Üyesi Profesör Doktor Ziya Kazi'yi kürsüye davet ediyoruz. Now to make his speech, I invite Professor Ziad Kasi, who is the Faculty of Emory University, Department of Emergency Medicine, Division of Medical Toxicology, and American College of Medical Toxicology board member, Professor Dr. Ziad Kasi, to the podium. Thank you, Teşekkürler. I'm practicing my Turkish. I'm watching uh, very uh, avidly Erdurum, uh, the release. And I've learned a lot of the words. Some of them are Arabic, like uh, Yani, Laki, and Fakad, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but I'm not that good yet, so uh, give me some more time. I'm only in season one. Um, honored guests, you know, leaders of healthcare and public health in Turkey, our colleagues, faculty, physicians, uh, pharmacists, our participants, our students. Um, it's my honor to be here. I want to thank you for this amazing um, welcome. Uh, on behalf of myself and the team, I'd like to recognize our team members. Uh, first of all, um, the chief of the Toxicology section at Emory University, Dr. Ben Morgan. If you mind standing up, please. Dr. Anna Yaffe, chief of the Global Health and Medicine section. Dr. Jonathan De Orlando. Ms. Hennem Donuk Henson, who's also a Turkish origin. And uh, Dr. Emily Kieran, who's not here yet, but uh, this is our team. And this shows the dedication of the Department of Mercy Medicine to Karbanis Technical University, to Farabi Hospital, and to Turkey. I stood here in the same place 11 years ago when I was a guest of the Mercy Medicine Association of Turkey and Karbanis Technical University for your annual conference. We had one day of toxicology, and that was my first visit to Trabzon. This is when I met Dr. Aynur Shaheen at the time. She was still a uh, uh, resident or a resident. And then she took my business card and then spent one month or two months with us in Atlanta doing a rotation. And through her persistence and the vision of the Turkish government that gave her uh, a scholarship and her determination and her family's sacrifice, she came to Emory in 2018 and did a stellar fellowship in, immersive, in uh, medical toxicology at Emory University. She integrated so well with everyone in the department that I saw in her a leader in toxicology in Turkey. Uh, rapidly after that, we held Mina Talks in Istanbul. We were probably the only conference that was held in person before the pandemic in 2020. We got away with it. Basically, we left Istanbul and the pandemic started. Alhamdulillah, nobody actually got the virus at uh, Mina Talks. We were in Nashantashi, the Redis of Lund. So, um, I'm going to keep my speech short because I had a presentation afterwards that describes more our work and our ideas for collaboration with Turkey. But I just want to say a couple of things. Number one, Turkey, from my perspective as a Lebanese citizen and an American citizen, is a success story, is a beacon of light in the Middle East, in the Arab world, in the region, in terms of healthcare, in terms of medical school education, in terms of immersive medicine. Ainur and I and our colleagues at Emory, we share a vision of the same success story in clinical and medical toxicology in Turkey. This subspecialty is not developed in most countries in the world. It is developed in the U.S., alhamdulillah. 
We believe that Turkey should be there as well. And I believe in your expertise, your commitment to innovation, your commitment to your people and to global health, you will get there. And now we have Aynur and Dr. Pinshuk and others who are toxicologists in your country to lead the charge with your support and guidance. And I just want to assure you that every university is committed to be involved with you on this journey, not only committed, honored to be on this journey. And I hope we get some time to discuss these ideas further. Uh, we've created the Middle East, North Africa, Clinical Disclosure Association with a group of our colleagues from the uh, Arab world. Ainu is a board member, member of Bina Talks. That's another group that can help Turkey in the future. And we hope we can increase our collaboration uh, for the success of this endeavor and the health of your people. Thank you. Thank you, Ziad Kazdi, for his uh, sincere speech. And now, to make her speech, I would like to invite Cardenas Technical University Faculty of Medicine Dean uh, Neşe Kaklikaya to the podium. Konuşmasını yapmak üzere Cardenas Teknik Üniversitesi Tıp Fakültesi Dekanımız Sayın Profesör Doktor Neşe Kaklikaya'yı kürsüye davet ediyorum. Değerli misafirlerimiz, Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi ve Emur Üniversitesi işbirliğiyle düzenlenen Uluslararası Tıbbi, Tıbbi Toksikoloji Konferansı'na ev sahipliği yapmaktan büyük onur duyuyoruz. Hepiniz hoş geldiniz, şeref verdiniz. 50 yıla yaklaşan köklü geçmişe sahip olan Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi Tıp Fakültemiz, her biri alanında yetkin, güçlü akademik kadrosu ile eğitim, araştırma ve sağlık sunumu alanında hizmetlerine aktif olarak devam etmektedir. 5000'e yakın hekim, 1500'e yakın alan uzmanı mezun eden fakültemiz, ikinci kez mezuniyet öncesi eğitim akreditasyonunu alarak eğitimde kalitesini kanıtlamış olup, şu anda uzmanlık alanlarıyla ilgili akreditasyon süreçlerini de aktif olarak sürdürmektedir. 832 yatak kapasitesi ki bunun 83'ü yoğun bakım yatağı olmak üzere e, bu kapasiteye sahip Farabi Hastanesi ile Doğu Karadeniz bölgesinin en önemli referans sağlık merkezi olan fakültemiz, kurumumuz sadece bölge halkına değil sağlık turizmi kapsamında uluslararası hastalara da kapılarını açmaktadır. Gelişen ve yenilenen cihaz farkı ile yeni ve güncel teknoloji ile sağlık hizmet sunumuna devam eden kurumumuz, 225 yataklı çocuk hastanesinin inşaatının tamamlanması ile daha çok çocuk hastaya ulaşmayı da planlamıştır. Sağlık hizmeti, sağlık eğitimi, sağlık araştırması, araştırmaları multidisipliner yaklaşım gerektiren en önemli alanlardır ve ben bugün burada Farklı disiplinlerden öğrencilerimizi, araştırma görevlilerimizi, akademisyenlerimizi ve bunun yanında ilimizin ve bakanlığımızın temsilcilerini bir arada görmekten gerçekten çok mutluluk duyuyorum, onur duyuyorum. Bunu da özellikle dile getirmek istedim. Ve e, teşekkürlerimi de sunmak istiyorum. Öncelikle teşriflerinden dolayı ilimizin ve bakanlığımızın temsilcilerine e, çeşitli protokolümüzün çok değerli üyelerine katılımları için, teşvikleri için ve tüm destekleri için e, rektörümüz Sayın Profesör Doktor Ahandolak Çuvalcı ve rektörlerimizin tüm ekibine çok teşekkür ediyorum. Başta e, doçent doktor Aynur Şahin olmak üzere onun heyecanını ilk günden beri böyle aktif olarak yaşıyorum. Neler hani ne kadar aktif çalıştığını biliyorum. Başta o olmak üzere Organizasyon Komitesi'nin çok değerli üyelerine ve bu konferansın düzenlenmesinde emeği geçen tüm ekibi canlı gelinden mutluyorum ve başarılı bir konferans olmasını diliyorum. Hepiniz tekrar hoş geldiniz. Thank you for our dean, for uh, her valuable words. 
And now, to make, her, to make his speech, I invite to Karadeniz Technical University Rector, uh, Professor Dr. Hamdullah Çuvaldı. Konuşmasını yapmak üzere, Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi Rektörümüz Sayın Profesör Dr. Hamdullah Çuvalcı'yı kürsüye davet ediyoruz. Protokolümüzün değerli üyeleri, değerli katılımcılar, saygıdeğer hanımefendiler, beyefendiler, sevgili gençler, sizleri üniversite adına selamlıyor, hoş geldiniz diyor, saygılar düşünüyorum. Böyle, öncelikle böyle önemli bir etkinliğin yeşil ve mavinin buluşma noktası olan güzel Trabzon'umuzda ve üniversitemizde gerçekleştiren onuru ve gururunu yaşıyorum. Türkiye'de kurulan dördüncü üniversite olan üniversitemiz yarım asır aşan eğitim, öğretim, araştırma ve topluma katkı tecrübesiyle istikrarlı büyüme eğilmesini sürdüren dış değerlendirme süreçlerinden geçerek 2021 yılında ülkemizde sadece 20 üniversitenin sahip olduğu araştırma üniversitesi ünvanını alma onurunu yaşamış bir eğitim, öğretim yuvasıdır. 2022 yılında ise bu yıl eğitim, öğretim, araştırma ve geliştirme, toplumsal katkı, uluslararası gibi alanlarda değerlendirilerek 5 yıllık tam akreditasyon belgesi almaya hak kazanmıştır. Bilginin üretimi, aktarımı ve paylaşımının en önemli amaç olarak belirlemiş olan üniversitemiz, ulusal ve uluslararası sempozyum, kongre ve benzeri organizasyonları desteklemektedir. Bugün gerçekleştirilen bu Uluslararası Toksikoloji Kongresi de bu amaca önemli katkılar sunacağını ümit ediyorum. Üniversitemizin stratejik hedeflerinden biri de uluslararasılaşmadır. Bu hedef doğrusunda Yemor Üniversitesi ile yaptığımız protokol kapsamında düzenlenen eğitimler ve protokolün sonucunda gerçekleştirilen bu kongre ile iki üniversite arasındaki işbirliğinin sonu değil, yeni ve daha kapsamlı bir birlikteliğin başlangıcı olmasını ümit ediyorum. Başta düzenleme kurulu olmak üzere kongrenin gerçekleştirilmesinde emek ve katkı sunan herkese teşekkür ediyor. Verimli bir kongre olmasını diliyorum. İyi günler dileklerimle, saygılarımla. valuable speech. Son olarak konuşmasını yapmak üzere Sağlık Bakanlığı Acil Sağlık Hizmetleri Genel Müdürü Sayın Doçent Doktor Eray Çınar'ı kürsüye davet ediyorum. I would like to invite the General Manager of Emergency Health Services of the Ministry of Health Associate Professor Dr. Eray Çınar to the podium make his speech. Sayın Rektörüm, Sayın Dekanım, kıymetli il müdürüm, değerli hocalarımız ve siz kıymetli katılımcılar. Öncelikle hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Bundan yaklaşık 10 yıl önce Sağlık Bakanlığı'nda e, başlamış olduğum Sağlık Bakanlığı'ndaki görevime ilk olarak Ulusal Zeyn Danışma Merkezi'nde başlamıştım. Orada bir yıl aktif olarak ve böyle çalışan bir hekim olarak e, bu süreçte zaten özellikle acil tıp, camiası, mensube hekim arkadaşlarımızla beraber aktif olarak özellikle toksikoloji zehirlenmelerle ilgili bizzat e, hani vaka yönetim süreçlerine en azından danışman olarak dahil olmuş birisi olarak da e, ve ayrıca bu şekilde multidisipliner bir yaklaşım gerektiren e, KBRN'de olduğu gibi toksikolojinin de bu şekilde kıymetli bir e, ve güzel bir organizasyonla konferansla burada siz değerli bilim üyeleriyle tartışılmasından dolayı öncelikle büyük bir heyecan ve mutluluk duyuyorum burada olmaktan. Ayrıca benim için ayrı bir kişisel mutluluk daha var. E, Karadeniz Tıp Fakültesi mezunu olaraktan yaklaşık 17 yıl sonra 
e, burada eğitim gördüğüm fakültem, e, üniversitemde, e, kampüste hatta bir parantez daha açayım, bence Türkiye'nin en güzel kampüsüdür. Olmaktan da ekstra bir mutluluk duyuyorum. Burada gördüğüm genç arkadaşlara da net bir şekilde söyleyeyim. Gerçekten Türkiye'nin en güzel kampüsü ve çok kıymetli, köklü bir üniversitesi burası. E, o yüzden de burada olmaktan dolayı ekstra bir mutluluk duyuyorum. E, Aynur Hocam'la da yine tanışmamız özellikle benim zehir danışma sözümden sonra bakanlık tarafından irtibatlandırmayla toksikoloji alanında birkaç hususla ilgili görüşmelerle başlamıştı. Ve e, nihayetinde Aynur Hocam'ın e, yapmış olduğu kıymetli bilimsel çalışmalarla, eğitimlerle beraber burada dekanımızın, rektörümüzün, ve diğer hocalarımızın da destekleriyle burada bu güzel organizasyona eşlik etmesi de özür diliyorum, önderlik etmesi de beni ayrıca mutlu etti. İnşallah çok güzel, faydalı bir konferans olur diyerekten güzel temennilerimi sunup hepinize tekrardan hoş geldiniz diyerek sözlerime son veriyorum. İyi günler. Monkeypox, 
highly infectious diseases and she will talk a little bit about how the nursing department can receive these patients a special session not toxicology but because she's here we wanted to make use of her expertise now in 2008 dr brent morgan started the international medical toxicology fellowship at emory this was started then because there's a need for physicians outside the u.s who want to do a fellowship in medical toxicology in the u.s and who do not have USMLE exams or are not trained in the ACGMEI program can train in toxicology. And since that time, we have graduated 22 fellows that are now back in their country developing toxicology on their own. Many of those fellows are actually graduates, are here today and participating as speakers and organizers of this conference. We are very proud of this achievement at Emory in collaboration with the Georgia Poison Center. We currently have three fellows enrolled, one from the United Arab Emirates and two from Oman. And this fellowship, in my opinion, has had a very important impact on the region. We've been able to work hand in hand with Minatox to advance the impact of Minatox. We've been able to uh, assist in the professional development of greater than 40 toxicologists in the region that are members of Minatox. We provide education, like we did for KTU online, as well as other residency programs in the region, like in Lebanon and Oman. And we assisted the Oman government in developing their national poison center guidelines. Occasionally, we assist in outbreak investigations. In Saudi Arabia, for example, there was an outbreak of contamination of sodium bicarbonate solution that led to methemoglobinemia. We assisted in that investigation. And most recently, as Dr. al hattali mentioned in her presentation, we petitioned the Arab Board of Emergency Medicine to certify a specialty in medical toxicology. And we've received approval, but that has not been announced yet, so you're hearing this even before the announcement, but inshallah soon, the Arab Board of Emergency Medicine will announce the creation of a subspecialty certification in medical toxicology. And this is a result of Minatox as well as indirectly the result of Emory University's engagement. Our vision for this at Emory is that we are going to be uh, involved in global clinical toxicology collaboration between Emory University and other countries or other universities. And some of the objectives of this project is to provide clinical telephonic consultation, deliver educational programs, collect data that we can use to do something with it, actionable data, exchange knowledge between the two institutions, exchange expertise between us and the other institution, and then conduct some research <coughs> that could also be funded by international funding agencies like the National Institute of Health in the US or others together because we can do that as a, as a partnering organization. Two partner organizations are much better uh, positioned to get this type of funding. We actually did this already in Lebanon. We were, uh, we, in 2015, because of my uh, origin in Lebanon, I became an adjunct professor at the American University of Beirut. And we have been taking call for Lebanon since 2015. Emory University, 24 hours a day, seven days a week takes call for the American University of Beirut, Ayn Hussein Hospital, the Rafiq Hariri Hospital, which is the government hospital, and we provide consultations. We trained one of their emergency physicians, Dr. Talat Zahran, who is now back in Lebanon, and she co-directs the service with me since she's been back. We were able to publish our data already after four years, describing the epidemiology of poisoning at this uh, at the American University of Beirut. We were also able to describe our experience doing this relationship over the phone. We've looked at the uh, possibility of saving emergency department visits, decreasing the number of ED visits, emergency department visits in children, because we think children often can stay home. They don't have to go to the hospital if you have a toxicology consultation over the phone. And we showed that in this study that we published. We also looked at an important problem in Lebanon. In Lebanon, uh, the abuse or substance use is not for opioids, it's more for benzodiazepine. We don't have a lot of heroin or uh, 
oxycodone overdose. We have more benzodiazepine overdose. So we studied that. Because in Lebanon, the doctors tend to prescribe this benzodiazepine a lot. And people can get it and become uh, uh, dependent on it and, and misuse it. We looked at environmental problems together in Lebanon. We looked at lead poisoning in Lebanon. Alhamdulillah, we did not find any problem, but we studied it. We looked at the incidence of the issues around, surrounding trauma and chemical exposures with the riots or the protests we had. We had a lot of protests in Lebanon. and We had the use of chemicals, tear gas. We looked at that. We also looked at snake bites and the nations in Lebanon. All of these projects resulted from this collaboration between Emory University and AUB. We also had some interesting case reports. For example, we have a plastic surgery procedure that uses lidocaine. It's an approved procedure by the government called tumescent liposuction that can cause lidocaine toxicity and death. We've had also pesticide exposures to zinc phosphide. It's been a fantastic experience in addition to other cases like botulism, like tetrodotoxin poisoning with pufferfish. And that's all been made possible because of the ability to work together between the US and Lebanon. Now, when you look at Turkey and you try to look for research in Turkey in toxicology, most research is really based on hospital experience, hospital based studies, which is a good place to start, but should not be the only place you stay. And this is a list of the papers that I could find that are not just case reports, more like retrospective studies or chart reviews, it, as well as the report from the uh, uh, uh, Turkish Poison Center located in Ankara, which was published in 2009. And you see some of the data out there, you know, some of these studies looking at the mortality rate from poisoning, looking at the most common cause of death, which was opioid toxicity in this study. Others showed different results, because this first study I just showed was a uh, study based on autopsy, different type of data than a, a study based on hospitals, where you will see more important exposures from sedative hypnotics, carbon monoxide, pesticides, and insecticides. And again, the same theme recurs that these hospital-based studies in Turkey are showing that intentional poisonings tend to be more common than unintentional in adults, less common in children, with the general categories of sedative hypnotics, tricyclic depressants as the main categories. Now, the Poison Center report in Ankara, uh, the Poison Center in Ankara report, is the last one I saw is 2009. It'll be um, uh, important to also look at this data and try to analyze it and see what patterns we see in Turkey because this is more of a national picture. But it's also important to get more recent data published so we can look at it as well and try to think about ideas for prevention and strategies in the future. Now, the collaboration we have uh, with uh, Emory and KTU was thanks to a grant. We received a grant from the Department of Mercy Medicine, Global Health and Mercy Medicine section that is led by Dr. Yafi. And of course, our chair, Dr. David Wright, he believes in global health. And Dr. Yafi is the inaugural head of that section. And we were one of the first group to apply for this grant that was awarded to us. And I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Morgan, whose uh, leadership uh, is essential in the success of this project. He actually takes call with us, despite his very busy schedule. He's one of the physicians that take call for Trap Zone. Mr. M. Uh, Donuk, who's uh, instrumental in her administrative expertise in getting the contract managed between the School of Medicine, the two schools of medicine, as well as uh, Dr. Yaffe and Dr. Jonathan Rook, who leads our research section. And this is our team. We are a team of 12, the magical 12. The way this worked is that Trap Zone physicians or residents contacted us using Dr. Nur Banu, who's a Turkish emergency physician, some of you may know her, who lives in California. So she would translate for us, because we, there are occasionally language barriers that we need to overcome. And she would do that translation on her own as a volunteer. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have our fellows that are receiving the call. These are some of our fellows that, some of them are graduated. Dr. Hassan Rushi graduated, he's here today. He is Hassan. Dr. Rita Farah, who actually now works in Virginia. But the other ones that are still there, 
are Dr. Suhaz Suleimani, Dr. Fatma Belushi, and there's Dr. Afka Suwedi, who I don't have a picture for her, but she's also currently part of the team. And then the faculty members are here. Brent, Morgan, Emily Kiernan, Jonathan Deolan, myself, and Aynur Shahin. So Aynur was also part of the global rotation. Of course, we can't also do that without the help of Cement, who's been entering the data, making sure all the data is complete in REDCap. And then Dr. Vilda Moser, who's also been kind of the uh, right hand of Aynur during the project. And now that Aynur is back in Istanbul, she's kind of our main point of contact right now for the project. Since we started on November 1st, 2021, until today we have over 245 consults that we've successfully conducted over the phone, and some of these cases are some of the most challenging cases that we've seen. I invite you to pay attention to Dr. Ainur's presentation, who will tell you more about the data shortly. We've only published one research project so far, it's minor case report. It was an Amanita muscaria poisoning. We had one also in the United States. Now we have two cases, and we were able to publish it. This is a very recent collaboration between uh, trap zone scientists and clinicians and Emory scientists and clinicians. So now the project is almost done. Our funding period ends November 1st this year. We need to discuss what we want to do for the future. And we hope we'll be able to discuss with KTU leadership some ideas for further collaboration. For example, our first important project is to share the data we collected with the Ministry of Health, of course with KTU, Ministry of Health, and then also the rest of Turkey through a publication. We need to publish this data. We need to look at the data carefully and see what other projects need to be studied. We will find things in the data that need further study. It will give us ideas. And these ideas can be explored by any of you in the room. This database is not Emory's database. This is KTU's database. And KTU's database is for its students and faculty to research and explore. We need to see what we're going to do. Are we going to renew our project? If we need to renew the project, we have to go ahead and do that with the School of Medicine, talking to each other and doing that. We can think of expanding into other areas of university medicine, like ultrasound, disaster medicine, neurologic research. What we can offer, we have a multitude of offerings in our department that we can build on with KTU. We can even expand outside university medicine. We have a very strong global health activity at Emory University, as well as at Emory School of Medicine. At these two levels, we can collaborate with KTU outside university medicine. We can work together on exchange of faculty, exchange of residents, apply for grants together. Together we can go after funding to support our efforts. Whether we can go after Turkish organizations, American organizations, or foundations, I think together we can be strong in this case. And that way we can do some good research and even as well collaborate in fellowship training. The day you start your fellowship program in Turkey, we will be honored to participate in this effort, if you need us to do so, and how you need us to do so, you will determine that. But I want to just remind you that in general, many departments of universities in the United States, they have global health interests. It's much better to have a global health interest for all countries. All of us, we need to look outside. This is good for all of us, right? And most people have a very broad view of the horizon. They look very widely, they look around for opportunities. The Emory University Global Clinical Toxicology Collaboration Initiative is a bit different. We look deep. We build a relationship with somebody and we go deep with them. And this is because we are very focused on our mission. We want to build a partnership, a friendship, and these usually take time. And if you keep changing your focus country, you cannot do that properly. And this is really what, something that I believe in, that I'm passionate about. And I would be honored if, if Turkey would be one of those countries that we can grow some deep roots with and weather the storms ahead of us. And thank you.
Uh, we will continue with uh, Ainur Shahin, uh, the results of this collaboration. Ainur Shahin, uh, Karadeniz Teknik Üniversitesi ile Emory Üniversitesi işbirliğini sonuçlarını açıklamak üzere sahneye davet ediyoruz. Thank you, Dr. Kazi, for a nice and informative presentation. This collaboration means a lot for our faculty and our, our students. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, share with you the descriptive epidemiology of toxicological exposures uh, of our project. I have no conflict of interest. So we did this project between 1st of November 2021 and 1st of October 2022. We had 244 toxicology exposure consultations and uh, most of the consultations were from adult AD. Pediatric consultations percentage was 25% and the rest of the consultations were from internal medicine, intensive care unit and other departments. This table shows us the age and gender distribution of poison exposures. The age distribution, the most common age group was young adults. So the age was between 20 to 50 years, whose percentage was 45%. When we checked the gender distribution, even the gender distribution is not unique across the age groups. A female and male ratio in total group was uh, one to one. Uh, but when you check the uh, data uh, det details, uh, first five years of exposures, uh, male, male population's percentage was four times higher than the females. However, uh, the t uh, uh, teenage group, uh, the age group between uh, 11 to uh, 18, uh, female population was uh, four times higher than the males. When we, keep, when we compare the National Poison Center data, which was published two years ago, uh, age and gender distribution percentages were similar. As to reason for exposure, the large majority of exposures uh, were intentional. And among the intentional exposures, uh, female population was uh, uh, 67% and the most common age group was young adults. Among the unintentional exposure group, male percentage was 53% and the most common age group was younger than 18 years old. It's also similar to the National Poison Set data which was published in 2020. As for root for exposure, the majority of exposures uh, due to ingestions. So the percentage was uh, 86%. Uh, which is really similar to NPC data. Other root exposures for inhalation exposures, thermal exposures, and bite and stings. This table shows us the categories and frequency of toxic agents. The majority of exposures were pharmaceutical, uh, whose percentage was uh, approximately 70%, and the five most common uh, pharmaceutical uh, toxic exposures were uh, antidepressants, sedative hypnotics and antipsychotics, analgesics, and cardiovascular drugs. The most common single exposure was sertraline, which is a SSRI. As to non-pharmaceutical agents, the top three was plants and mushrooms, alcohol intoxications, especially toxic alcohol intoxications, snake and scorpion animation. When we compare the NPC data, the top exposures among the populations were anti-inflammatory agents, antidepressants, and antipsychotics. The most common exposure in uh, NPC data was paracetamol, which is quite different uh, from our results, uh, but uh, the, most of the percentages were similar. When we compare these toxic agents into the age groups, uh, the population younger than 18, the top agent in pharmaceutical exposure was antidepressants. And especially the top agent in non-pharmaceutical exposures, the most common agent was pesticides and uh, rodenticides. Uh, when we check the group uh, age between 18 and 50, the top agent in pharmaceutical exposure were uh, sedative hypnotics. Uh, as to non-pharmaceutical exposures, the top agents was uh, alcohols, toxic alcohols. The age uh, older than 50, uh, the pharmaceutical exposures, the top agent was uh, antidepressants. Uh, and as to 
know pharmaceutical exposures, the top agent in this uh, group was uh, plants and mushrooms. Uh, the exposures, depending on the reason, uh, among the unintentional exposure group, the top agent in pharmaceutical exposures was uh, cardiovascular drugs. Uh, the top agents in non-pharmaceutical exposures was plants and mushrooms. Exposures, depending on the intentional exposures, the most uh, common agent was uh, antidepressants. Uh, in a pharmaceutical exposures, uh, as to non-pharmaceutical exposures, the top agent was cleaning substances. When we compare these agents into the gender group, uh, among the female group, the most common agent was uh, sedative hypnotics as a pharmaceutical exposures. Uh, however, uh, in non-pharmaceutical exposures, the top agent was plants and mushrooms. This is the male group, the top age of in male group was uh, antidepressants as a pharmaceutical exposure and in non-pharmaceutical exposure the top agent was toxic alcohols. As to the medical outcome, which is the most important part, because when you check the NPC data you cannot find any follow-up results or any medical outcome. This is the uh, thing that we want to point out. So the majority of our patients had no effects. They, uh, the percentage was 70%, and we had only three fatal outcomes, two of them due to methanol poisoning, and one of them was due to cautious toxicity. As to the disposition, the most, uh, the most common disposition of patients, evaluation, treatment, and discharge, 14% uh, of the patients left against the medical advice, and 10% of the patients admitted to intensive care unit and rest of the patients observed uh, by our critical care unit. As to the treatments, the majority of patients, only, uh, uh, most of the patients received symptomatic and supportive care which percentage was uh, 60% and the most common administered antidotes were N-acetylcysteine, sodium bicarb, uh, IV ethanol and vitamin K. During this project, we had two bad outbreaks. The first one was methanol outbreak, and second was uh, hallucinogenic mushroom outbreak. In methanol outbreak, it occurred between December 2021 and February 2022. We had 15 patients, all of them were male. All of, uh, all of them uh, has uh, got treatment, IV ethanol, hemodialysis. And most, of, uh, most common symptoms were blurred vision, uh, mental status change, and GI symptoms. Uh, we had two deaths uh, due to methanol poisoning, one blindness, and two neurologic So what did we do as a team? Uh, we made some interventions to increase awareness among the physicians, also in public. So we prepared educa educational sessions and practical clinical algorithms for emergency physicians. Also, we, we made interviews with media, social media, and uh, the rest of the media. We all communicated <coughs> on local and main hospitals to get aware about the methanol outbreak. And we also collaborated with Dr. Nut Eric Hoda for public education. They have a, a nice uh, video for the public, and we translated into Turkish and uh, shared with the all uh, media. The second outbreak was hallucinogenic mushroom outbreak, uh, which, which was due to a cyrospin type of mushroom. It occurred between March and April 2022. We had 14 patients. The mean age was 55, and 60% uh, of the population were, uh, were female. And the uh, common symptoms were uh, GI symptoms, somnolence, and hallucinations. But uh, hopefully all patients recovered and discharged in a healthy condition. And we did a, a poster presentation in these cases to the American College of Medical Toxicology National Conference. Uh, we collaborated uh, with Emory University and share our data at this conference. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, I would like to have. Thank you. Video? Okay. The, the, the KTU developed a very nice video for the methanol outbreak to, for education. I think it's worth showing. I think we can also watch. Yeah, it's worth it.
think this is a great example of the role of uh, a poison center or clinical toxicologists in uh, you know, outbreaks. And we add sign language also this video, this is a new part of version, and they uh, got this uh, sign language version uh, from uh, Holland. They also shared their website. <laughs> Nice animation. We also did interviews. We did the interviews, yeah, many interviews. And the language was Turkish, but we cannot hear the voice, so for that. Now we'd like to just hear from you, you know, what questions you have, what ideas you have about this data, um, what experience you want to share, you know. When I look at this data, uh, one thing that uh, is uh, interesting to me is the uh, number of cases involving uh, plants and mushrooms is quite high compared to the United States. In the United States, we have about 2-3% to of our poison center data is usually plants or mushrooms. Here it's 8%. Uh, maybe someone can comment on that. Why is that uh, the situation in, the, in this region? I think I can make a comment. We have, a, we have the best nature of, <laughs> of Turkey. So people like to go and see around, you know, to the hills and the nature. So they enjoy picking up some plants and mushrooms. That's why we have a, a common poison of plants and mushrooms, I think. Yeah. Those can be challenging, of course, because you have to identify the plant or the mushroom. It's really challenging. Therapies are often supportive. So I think that's an area where there could be more education from the public to prevent these exposures, you know, raising awareness about the dangers. Yes, exactly. So we Dr. Tanchuk, microphone, please. Thank you for the presentation of the data uh, of uh, your research. Uh, I would like to ask uh, about the use of uh, common antidotes uh, in, in, in the poisoning cases. You listed the common uh, antidotes, and yes. the last one was the uh, vitamin K. Yes. Uh, I just, I'm just wondering, uh, tomorrow I will give a speech about the anticoagulant antidotes, <laughs> and uh, you listed the 10 cases uh, of uh, vitamin K uh, uh, administration. Yeah, administration. Yeah. Uh, what What was the um, uh, poisoning? It was the warfarin, comedin, comedin poisoning. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it rat poison uh, or or uh, most of, just most of the cases were uh, you know comedin tablets, not uh, super warfarin. So we had just uh, two or three super warfarin exposure, and we didn't give any extra uh, antidotal therapy. They all was well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. This is a table of antidotes. And you see here there was the use of ethanol. Yeah. Ethanol. Is ethanol for, for methanol. Yes. Which is difficult to use because it causes phlebitis in the vein. It causes it difficult to titrate the level to be effective. So there's an antidote called flumepizol. But we don't have it. That is much more effective. It. So this is another area to develop maybe a treatment like flumepizol in Turkey that could be used in these cases. It's much more effective, easier to use, and safer. Um, show you that again. Any other questions or comments? We hope to publish this. Uh, we, have, we have to look at the data again and make sure we clean up everything and get it ready. We're still collecting data until the end of the month. Good morning. My name is Joy. I'm from University. I have to thank you for your presentation, all of you. I wonder if you have any patients uh, honey poisoning in uh, your center because I know we know that in Karadeniz area uh, it's may be many uh, patients uh, as a result of uh, delivery. You know, uh, yes, uh, yes, I do. Is there any patients in your service? Yeah, sure. Uh, the problem is that most of the meth honey poisons can manage at other public okay. hospitals. Uh, meth honey poisoning. Meth honey poisoning. But the thing is that we have small number of 
that's honey poison because all the local hospitals can, you know, uh, evaluate and can treat uh, methane poison with methane poisoning because it's very common in our region. So that's why in our data they are not uh, they are not a very high uh, percentage of all of the population. That's why. Uh, in addition, uh, just a little uh, patients uh, we admit to our emergency department because in our area, so there are many tourists uh, travel in your uh, center. Yes. And what's your advice for these patients to us? If in terms of what? Yes, what's your uh, primary advice to uh, diagnosis for... Uh, Methane poisoning? Yes, yes. Yes, so uh, they need to be careful about local uh, honey uh, producers to pick up some honey to they don't know. So I think that there will be a method in the future to detect the grain from the honey. So maybe in the future, uh, this might be, we will see less methane poisonings. But you know, methane is just uh, not for, uh, they are using for uh, traditional uh, purposes as an alternative medicine. So I think even uh, they detect the grain in, in a simple amount of uh, percentage, people uh, is gonna uh, eat it again because they, they think that they are so useful for other uh, disease and other alternative uh, treatments, yeah. And I, I would add that uh, uh, this type of topic, uh, uh, uh, food, a food toxin, is of, uh, is of interest to other uh, embassies, like US Embassy, uh, European Union, because of business and trade. So they would potentially fund a project where Dr. Gunduz, for example, you know, maybe develop an essay, something qualitative that could be done at the point of, point of sale to test. We have these essays developed for in the U.S. for shellfish, for Ciguatera toxin, for example, for other shellfish poisoning. But usually, embassies would fund these projects because they worry about business and tourism, travelers coming, as you said. Yes, exactly. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Is there an antidote for this? Grenotoxin? Just we use um, uh, atropine or IV hydration if needed. Thank you. Yes, sir? Yes, ma'am? Um, thank you for your fluently presentation. Uh, I'm Ilfa Teş from uh, Department of Family Medicine. Um, for evaluating our patients, what kind of plants do you mention? Okay, so the most of the plants were anticholinergic plants, like the Trastromoium, Atropoline, Dodona poisonings. But the thing is that we have lots of mushroom cases also. And hopefully these mushroom cases were not the cyclopeptide containing mushrooms. So most of the patients recovered in a really quick situation. Uh, but uh, generally we don't have any bad cases or any bad outcome cases from these poisonings. Thank you. We did uh, have the challenging case, one of the most challenging cases yes, we have. Yes, sorry, I forgot to tell. We have only one uh, pediatric case which, has, uh, which was a colchicine toxicity due to the uh, colchicine plant. Uh, but hopefully she recovered in a health condition. We, uh, co they, co they consulted us, this patient from pediatric IC unit. She has stayed at hospital for 15 days. And during this, uh, during this stage, uh, she didn't need any extra corporal membrane oxygenation therapy. And just supportive therapy worked for her, hopefully. And we discharged her with uh, pediatric, uh, pediatric department. And we had two cases of rice. We had two ladies in the trap zone uh, chew uh, castor beans and develop rice toxicity. Alhamdulillah, they were okay. They were sick for a few days, vomiting, diarrhea. Yes. But it looks like the beans were not very, did not have a lot of uh, rice toxin in them, which is known. Different beans grown in different parts of the world can have different uh, concentration of rice. This is another. Potentially fatal. One synthesis. of them was for suicidal ingestion. He oh. checked the website and looked at ricin is really dangerous, so he tried to ingest it and hopefully he didn't chew it. That's why uh, the toxicity didn't develop on these patients. Yeah. It was fascinating for us in the US to take care of these patients because we had new cases for us. For example, we had a snake bite in Turkey that caused a stroke, a stroke. syndrome. I never heard of that. And then I knew said, oh yeah, this is something we see in Turkey. <laughs> No. What was that snake? It was uh, a viper. One of the vipers that caused the stroke. Dr. Lopez. This is exciting uh, data. Uh, congratulations on, Thank you. on this. Uh, looking at this antidote sheet, 
one of the uh, common, not so common, but occasionally we, we had run into hospitals that don't have a particular treatment, don't have antidote. Did you run into any situation where maybe recommended antidote, but there was un it was unavailable? This is a great question. So we have the toxicology critical, we have toxicology uh, inpatient unit. However, the antidote stop kidney center was at Kalani uh, Research and Training Hospital. It's a different hospital. It uh, belongs to the Ministry of Health. So if we need any specific antidotal therapies, but most of the antidotal antidotes we have in our department, however, some of the specific antidotes were uh, is talking at that center. So if we have any case, we get in contact with them and they help us. And uh, it's very close to us, 10 minutes by driving. So it's not a problem for us, yes. Thank you. And that's important to think about antidote needs in Turkey, in Trabzon based on data, what are you using, what do you need, and planning for this, and prioritizing depending on the type of the agent that is uh, being treated with this antidote. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Uh, hi, I'm Neil. Uh, uh, it's my last year, I'm a medical student. Uh, I want to ask, is there any intoxication uh, related with any chronic disease or like cancer or like methotrexate? Yeah. We had uh, a fatal case of methotrexate as a philopathy. This was a person that was uh, using methotrexate therapeutically yes, exactly. and then she yeah. made a mistake, right? Yeah, made a mistake. She, methotrexate regimens are confusing. So she confused her dose and she had encephalopathy, which is very rare, and died. Died, yeah, unfortunately. And uh, the other question for Turkey is lead poisoning. You know, what is the question about lead? Lead is a very easy, well, it's a very rewarding type of question to ask because you can uh, implement preventive, public health prevention. And uh, this is uh, the week for uh, lead poisoning prevention by WHO. This is the World Health Organization week for lead, prevent, lead poisoning prevention. So it's important to do some studies, even at the level of Trabzon only, to look at lead, uh, prevalence of elevated blood lead levels in children in, uh, in Trabzon. That's another easy project. Not only in Trabzon, we need for all of our country oh. because we don't have any data about... Uh, start, yes. yeah, start small, you know, and that's a nice project for a faculty member or a resident to do. It's not that, not that difficult. Thanks so much. Any other questions or contributions or comments? If not, okay, so we can move on to lunch. So we will be here at 1.30. Thank you for your attention and participation. Thank you. Um, our lunchbox service for our participants will take place on the lower floor in the coffee break area. See you again at Oturumumuz sonlanmıştır. Katılımcılarımız için lunch box servisimiz kafe break alanında bir alt katta gerçekleşecekti. Saat bir buçukta tekrar burada görüşmek üzere. Yalnız lunch box servisimiz saat 12'de gerçekleşecek. O yüzden de bilgilerinizi sunduk. Teşekkür ediyorum. These are states that have a poison center. So in Georgia, you see there's only one poison center. But a state more populous Say California to the left, they have four poison centers. Look at Texas. Uh, I don't know if there's a point around there. Texas. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Florida. One, two, three. Georgia. Just one. Now, you see the dots right here? Right there? Those are states that don't have a poison center. However, they contract with other states to provide poison center services. So when you look at Hawaii, um, you look at uh, Alaska, uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, these places don't have a poison center, but they use other states, like, like this poison center here covers this. Uh, this poison center right here covers a bunch of these other states. So you don't have to have a poison center in a state, but you have a poison center that serves a region. And so 
Me, I, I am uh, a center of, uh, that serves, like I said, over almost 11 million people, and I'm in the capital city uh, in Georgia. Now, in the, in the white, the bold white, this is what you need to be looking at. But you can see here in the gray, these are all the programs that all of a sudden we develop over the 20 or 30 years of my uh, service in the Poison Center. When you're starting, you want to start simple. So the goal should be starting with just offering Poison Center services. But over time, we develop console service. Uh, how many of you have pets? Animals. Okay. We are also an animal Poison Center. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll love this fact about animals. I have three. Of course, they're family members. But do you realize that we get more compliments treating animals than we do children? People praise us more for, for helping their animal. They don't care about their child. They care more about their pets. So we get more people thanking us about treating their animals. But the, the problem, uh, or the good news why they call us is it's free. When they're asking about, uh, oops, when they're asking about, um, their, uh, when, when they're asking about their um, animal, we're giving them advice for, for no money. Okay, so let me get back to that slide. Um, we also run a variety of other public health hotlines. Remember when I told you that we are involved in, in uh, protecting public health and improving public health? For just the poison center, yes, we treat poisonings. But we have helped out in, in other situations like H1N1. We have developed call centers for COVID, for monkeypox, all that coming into the poison center. So we start as an information service for poison, but because we're so valuable to our public health department, our department of health, they say to us, Gaylord, can you also be a hotline for COVID? Can you also be a hotline for uh, disaster relief? Can you also be a hotline for uh, Ebola? We said yes. And then when we say yes, they give us more money, you know, to do those services. But you don't start with everything. These, I did not inherit all of this. I inherited one thing. I inherited this, human poisons only. And I also inherited uh, a, a department that did public education, and I didn't even, we didn't even have social media in 1988. That has developed over time, but one of the key roles that I play is whenever there's a, a very uh, important poison case, uh, I will be on TV talking about it. Remember when we had synthetic uh, cannabinoids, synthetic marijuana? When that hit our region, they came to us as the experts, so I was able to get on TV and talk about the dangers. Part of my job is to inform the public and give them warnings about these new trends. Bath salts and uh, Enbome and all these designer drugs, when they started affecting our population, they would come to the experts and ask for Dr. Kazi, Dr. Morgan, myself, to get on TV and talk about it. So our involvement in improving public health is vital to what we do. Now, when you, when you look at our data, it's collected because of how busy we are as a poison center. Okay, and you look at the, the, uh, the people who who I work with, remember, this is what I inherited. The state of Georgia, 24 hours a day, okay? And you see here that uh, in 1988, we only had two toxicologists. We, we taught some pharmacy students, but we didn't have any of this yet. We had none of that. And so when, if, if you're considering starting a program, you will start with deciding what your service area is and whether or not you want to do this part of the day or all of the day. And so 
None of this existed. This is me today. I have this, I have this, I have this. I have all this. But I didn't have it in 1988. So when you look at how I have grown in the years subsequent to 1988, I started with a, a staff of two nurses and six other professionals. So I only had eight people who worked for, for me when I inherited. Over 34 years, we now have five pharmacists, eight nurses, five MDs, plus three others, and that's now uh, a total of 21 full-time people who are working the hotlines. When I first started, I had eight. To do my work in public health, because the public health projects like Ebola, like H1N1, like COVID, they are also part of the center, but they're handled not by poison specialists, but by public health uh, call center specialists. I had none when I started in 1988. And then uh, now I have eight, eight, full, eight people who work uh, and covered the telephone for 18 hours a day. So you can see how much I've grown. So all these things I'm talking about are things that you can aspire to. I didn't have any of this when I started, but the program grew over time because of how valuable we were to the Department of Health. The Department of Health said, you are so valuable, we'll add you more money. You are so valuable, we'll let you hire more staff. You're doing such a good job in providing us good data, we're gonna give you more money. This is how we built our program. Now, when you look at our data, and as I mentioned, data is so important, we're able to, to tell a story about our service by looking at our data. And this is very basic data, but this is important data. You know, who is calling you? And what are they calling you about? And you see in the latest year, last year, 50% uh, of our calls were about children less than 12 years of age, the majority of them uh, less than six. And if I took less than six, you'll find that about 80% of those less than six are about two years old or three years old. That's the majority. And then, of course, 30% uh, is between the age of 20 and 59. But this comes from data. Georgia Poison Center in Atlanta is the second busiest poison center in the United States. The first busiest is in Colorado. But here's their problem. They're cheating with their data. Why are they cheating? Because they handle five states. Remember I told you some states don't have a poison center? Well, Colorado covers five states. Georgia, Atlanta, we only cover one. So sometimes I'm bragging that I'm the busiest poison center in the country, or in the world for that matter. Because as a single poison center, just if you look at human exposures, we are about 75,000 calls for humans annually. So that makes us very busy. Okay. Now, we also are understanding a little bit of the uh, uh, type of exposure. Where is it happening? You see here that the majority of calls that we get come from the parents, from the grandparents, from the family, and it's coming from their own residents. Nine out of every ten calls come from uh, the home. And if you look at where... Uh, uh, or excuse me, yeah, nine out of 10 come from the home. When you look at uh, healthcare calls, healthcare doctors and nurses and pharmacists and EMTs, when you look at the overall volume between the public and healthcare, almost 27% of all our calls come from the hospitals, the ERs. And that's a the reason why that's a significant number is, of course, these calls right here are the most difficult. There's no question. A hospital case is much more, diff more difficult. And from this batch right here, this is where our, our medical toxicologists get a lot of their training. 
Because think about it, if you're, if you're talking about 30%, you know, almost one out of every three calls you get is from the hospital, those are gonna be the most critical and the more difficult calls will start with the poison specialist and then they'll work their way up to uh, have the medical toxicologist consult. And so uh, this, is, uh, this is a significant uh, number to remember because this is one that helps our training both from uh, the clinical side and the medical toxicology side. Now, looking at our data, this is just pharmaceutical agents, not all poisonings uh, in general, because one of my colleagues will be talking about uh, some of the poisonings that happen in the home, but some of this shouldn't surprise you, right? When you look at the data, what are the top five categories of medicines that, poison, that our poison center is uh, handling? So number five is vitamins. Very popular call in, in our poison center. Then comes the homeopathic and herbals, Antihistamines number three, antidepressants number two, and does anyone want to know what number one is? What, what do you think the number one category is? Analgesics. That's the one we get called about most frequently. Now, when you're looking at putting together a poison center, we have to begin with looking at who do we want as leaders, who do we want on our staff? And when you look at leaders, you need to look for leaders who have the training in certain areas, whether it's scheduling or budget, uh, maybe they finished uh, a degree in toxicology. When you look at staff, as I mentioned, I think you need to start off with considering nurses or pharmacists, but we also have non-medical staff. Training, you need to develop a system for training. This is what's key. Enor took our, our training class and she knows how easy it was, right Enor? <laughs> she knows how, how difficult it is. But in order to have quality service, you have to have rigorous training. And once you're done with training, that's not all. You also have to provide continuing education for your staff so that they stay up to date. You also have to have the appropriate resources. What data do you look at? Do you use toxins? Do you use micromedics? What do you use as your databases? And of course, at the end, money talks. You need uh, backing from the ministry. You need support in terms of money from, from uh, somewhere because it, it's not a lot of, it, it, it, it's not cheap to run a poison center. When you look at um, our infrastructure, you have to also be able to uh, set up a, a phone system, a recording system, and, and I know uh, Dr. Padrillo, when she was starting her poison center, one of the things she was really concerned about were treatment guidelines, protocols that your, that your specialists have to follow. All these have to be developed. And, and we, uh, because we trained Dr. Padrillo, we were sharing with her our treatment guidelines, and then she would take some of those and make some of those her own and tailor it to her population. So, when you talk about our, one of our vital functions, it's saving healthcare dollars. When you talk about reducing ER visits, reducing length of stays, there are many studies that have shown significant cost uh, decreases. And I'm gonna show you one slide. If there's one important slide in this whole presentation that's, that's best describe how valuable poison centers are. To run every poison center in the United States, it would cost $100 million. I know what my budget is. There are 55 poison centers in the country. It costs $100 million to run everybody. Now, if you spend $1 on poison centers, studies have shown that you could save a minimum of seven, maybe 15. So when you look at the total cost savings, it's $900 million saved in healthcare costs by having a poison center. That's a significant number. So when, you're, when your government is saying, we can't afford you, you basically can show them that you, there's no way you cannot not afford us. 
You have to be able to fund this because if we save money, there's only one program that saves more money than poison. That's vaccinations. It's the only other program. Poison comes in second. And in America, we save almost $1 billion annually. Lastly, as we talk about public health activities, these are some of the things that I didn't have when I first started in, in poisoning. Uh, and that's, I could spend another hour just lecturing there. But as it relates to education, I've, of, I've often told my colleagues, yes, we are measured by how many calls we get. That's clear, we, we talk about the numbers. But you know what's also important to me? The number of calls we don't get. If I can prevent poisoning from happening, that's a significant savings. So if I, so what I tell my colleagues, yes, measure me by how busy I am. But I like to also say measure me by the calls that I never get. It's the prevention strategies that we have, whether it's the media or social media. And then lastly, remember that, yes, patient care is the core function. Working alongside the medical and other clinical toxicologists is important. Uh, but for us, we think a poison information service is vital to an area because you can provide information in a very timely manner over the phone. Uh, and you can um, also be involved in many public health activities. And you saw how active I am with other programs related to public health. It won't be easy because people will fight you. They'll fight you and say there's, there's no need for this service. There's, there's, we don't have any money to do this service. But you have to persevere, you have to overcome. And with the opportunities that I've been able to have in the Middle East and now in Turkey and this region, if this area needs assistance, I'm more than glad to try to help. Because I think this is something vital you see that the National Poison Center uh, doesn't have very much structure. They're not producing uh, many reports. I think we need to start small because when I started, when our program started in 1970, the area that we took on was about 400,000. Perhaps in, in the surrounding areas is 400,000. We started only with nine to five. You can start at nine to five. At the beginning, we didn't even have nurses that started. You know how you got hired in 1970? If you could pronounce a long chemical name, that's how you got a job. If you could pronounce methyl ethyl incredibly terrible, you got the job. So, but it developed over time. You needed more specialty. You needed a nurse, you needed a pharmacist, you needed a doctor to, to answer the telephone. And so, even today, in 2022, I still have to fight for my money. I still have to beg the government to give me more money. I still have to go to my state senators and ask for more money. I already have proved I save lives. I already have proved that I save money. But it's still so difficult to get money. That's my time already. I appreciate your attention, and I'll be available for questions after the last one. And the point that you point out that poison centers are really important for public health and for all of us. So I hope in the future we can have one accredited poison center, and we will discuss how can we do it in the next sessions. But now I would like to introduce Dr. Ziad Kalsi. He is the professor of the uh, Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory University. Uh, he is also a founder board member of Middle East North African uh, Clinical Toxicology Association. And he is my dear mentor, <laughs> one of my dear mentors. Now he is, uh, today we will talk about the clinical toxicology and poison centers in countries belong, belonging to WHO. Thank you. Thank you, Leilur. Um, thanks, Gaylord. That was a great presentation as usual. I was lucky to study under Gaylord. He looks young, but he's not that young, by the way. Uh, he actually trained me uh, at, uh, at Emory Junior Poison Center. And um, I'm very lucky because I did learn uh, toxicology and poison center uh, functions from the Georgia Poison Center that has this perfect uh, environment that syncs up with public health and 
and fix up with patient care and research and all the stuff that he talked about. So I was lucky to have arrived years after they had only two spies. But I still arrived quite early. I arrived to my fellowship in 2003. We're still uh, certainly improving. We're already now much better than we were in 2003. But um, this uh, fortune that I have helped me look at the region, my region, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Turkey, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean region, to look at it and, um, uh, you know, have a perspective on how it can improve. Because I've experienced the Georgia Pollution Center, but I also love this region and I want to help this region. So I decided finally to get data. You know, we talked in the morning about the importance of data. So I decided to research this question about the poison centers in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO, WHO Amro. And I also wanted to look at the clinical toxicologists that are in this region, as far as I could tell, the ones that I knew that I could ask to fill a survey for me. So that's what I'm going to share with you right now, is recent research data that has not been published yet. We will publish it, inshallah, very soon. And my research team includes Dr. Badria Al-Hattali and Dr. Tarban Sahran, as well as my medical student, who is now my emergency medicine resident, Dr. Kiri Krishnas. Now, um, the issue with poison centers and toxicological exposures, we've we'll been talking about this all day. But the bottom line is, we should all re recognize that poisonings are a problem for Turkey and for the region. They are. They're killing people. They're killing people, they're hurting people, and they are sometimes preventable. So that makes it even more, more difficult to accept because these are preventable injuries and preventable death. We also believe that the situation varies from one city to another, from one country to another, and some cities or countries have more resources than others, but certainly having a poison center and having a medical toxicologist and or a clinical toxicologist can help provide better care, better advice, better prevention. So it's important to have these resources in every country and possibly in every city. Now, the interesting thing about WHO EMRO, the region, the countries, they are very different from each other. Some countries are uh, very well resourced, others are not. Some are in war or conflict, some are not. So that's also another problem of the WHO EMRO region. And nobody's really looked at this question uh, in this region in terms of poison centers and toxicology. Now, luckily for us, this is a good time for toxicology. Because WHO, the World Health Organization, and its sustained development goals, recent sustained development goals, has really added chemical exposures. Finally, finally, WHO looked at this question, not just looking at infectious diseases like they used to in the past. They have added chemical exposures. They have also added clean water, clean air, uh, eliminating chemicals like mercury or lead. There have been some initiatives from WHO that have given us, toxicologists, some more value in the government view. They also published these guidelines on how to uh, have a poison center. And actually, Dr. Mohammed Amin, who is one of our Minatox board members, participated in drafting these guidelines. So that's good. This is good that we have this document. Now also, you may or may not know that WHO has launched an international project looking at snake bites. They're trying to find where the snakes are, they're testing the antivenom. If your antivenom polysera that you use in Turkey can, can potentially submit their product to WHO to analyze it for looking at efficacy and effectiveness and safety as well. So these are important initiatives by WHO to help us. So it's really, again, a good time for us to be here. The, um, uh, the question with poison centers in the Eastern Mediterranean region also has been addressed by another group of non-profit organization called the Eastern Mediterranean Poison Center Network. This is newly formed in 2019. They try to involve only poison centers. So for example, someone like me is not involved in this, but every poison center is invited to participate. For example, Pedria, participates on behalf of Oman. I believe uh, uh, Lina and Yazid participate on behalf of Qatar. 
uh, you know, different countries in the East Mediterranean. I don't believe Turkey is, is, is included, right, but they, but they consider it not part of the East Maybe they don't consider you part of the East Mediterranean. But this is a group that met in 2019 and made some recommendations as well Turkey about is poison not included, yeah. Turkey I'm sorry? Is not, Turkey is not included. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so that is not included, unfortunately. But anyway, this is a small group, a new group that just formed. So what I did, I, wa I went ahead and surveyed every single country in M WHO MRO about their poison center, and I surveyed those colleges. Now, for you who don't know the list of WHO MRO countries, here's the list. And you can see the whole list in it. Now, Turkey is not included in MRO. Okay, this is WHO list. Some, some people consider Turkey an MRO. But the official list of WHO does not include them. Okay? And this is the, these are the names. There are 22 countries. We did a survey of these poison centers in these 22 countries by interviewing on Zoom the director of the poison center or whoever was the previous director or somebody who knows about it, like a Ministry of Health official. For the survey of toxicologists, we sent an electronic survey on using the survey tool Altrix. And uh, for the poison centers, when we talked to the poison center director, we asked them about their poison center. What does it look like? What do you do? Uh, you, do you have a building, an office? Do you have a database? Are you open 24 hours a day, seven days a week? We had a series of questions, questionnaire that we asked them over the phone. And if, we did, if they don't understand the question, we give them answers, clarification. We also asked them questions to clarify what they answer. So it was a back and forth discussion. It was recorded and we wrote it down also. The uh, uh, electronic survey, again, was a series of questions asking about the activities of people, these toxicologists, what do they do, their training, how happy are they are with their job, are they getting paid for their job, and what are their perceived needs in the future. We knew of 56 people that we knew are clinical toxicologists in the Anglo region. We knew them, it was more like a convenience center. They were members of Minatox, basically. Plus, some people that we knew were clinical toxicologists, but they were not members of Minatox. And we came up about 56 people, because the Minatox members are about 40. And with about 16, and we knew, we knew personally that they were in the country and they were clinical toxicologists. We looked for people that were basically a pharmacist or a physician that is, you know, actively practicing clinical toxicology. And unfortunately, out of 56 people we invited to do the survey, only 32 responded. So remember that number 32 when you look at the data later on. Okay? And I'll remind you anyway, don't worry. Now going first, let's talk about first the poison center survey. What did we ask about? We asked about the elements that were recommended by WHO and their guidelines that Dr. Amin participated in drafting. So these are, ten, uh, these are the uh, 10 elements that the WHO says poison center should have. They include a call center, so which we call a poison information center, so every poison center should have a call center. Clinical services for the management of poisoning, so they should be able to, uh, you know, take care of patients potentially as well, have a unit, a clinical care unit. Have a lab to test for toxic toxicants. Conduct toxical vigilance activities to so watch for toxic uh, effects of drugs and participate in prevention of poisoning. They must have a role in public health emergencies. They must know or stockpile antidotes and antivenoms. They must collect data and use information databases as well as have staff that's trained in quality assurance to make sure the quality of the poison center is there. And finally, they should have independent, secure sources of funding. This is what the WHO thinks the poison center should have. And I agree with all of these, by the way, uh, to, to, to, to, to, to, to a great extent. I may differ in a couple of areas, but in general, I agree with all of these uh, categories that were recommended by WHO. So we asked the director of the poison center that we were interviewing if they had all of these. And each one of these categories has some elements inside of it. We tried to ask as many as we can, but remember we had like one hour on the Zoom call, so we sometimes skipped a couple of subcategories that were not as important. We asked the ones that were most important on the negative. 
And I've interviewed Dr. Yazid Eldos from Qatar, I've interviewed Dr. Badri Hantali from Oman, and we spent an hour with them on the phone completing the survey. We also decided ahead of time that each thing you have under the category, each item that you have uh, as a yes under each category will give you a point. So you score points, you know, based on what you answer in this list. And the total number of points you can get, the maximum number, if you had everything we asked about, would be 36 points. Because the way we gave the points to every item that we asked about. We did that because we wanted to get a benchmark. We wanted to give a score to each poison center country. Not because we're saying you have a bad poison center or a good poison center or you passed or you failed it. This, not was, this was not the purpose. The purpose was to really get an idea about the score so that next time when you do any progress, you can look at your score again and see if you've improved. It also gave us an idea about the region. What is the benchmark, the average for the region? So if you are below the average, that means you should go up to that average. So how can we have a common picture together? And again, the total number of possible points here were 36. The first result I want to share with you is that out of 22 countries in EMRO, we were able to identify 13 that had a poison center and that we were able to interview. Two that we thought they have a poison center but we were not able to interview, they did not interview with us. And then seven countries did not have a poison center. So seven out of 22 countries in our region, seven, almost a third, do not have a poison center at all. And then 15 do. We only interviewed 13 of them. And these are the countries that we interviewed, including the two that we did not, were not able to interview. And this is the list, you can recreate the list. And these are the countries that did not have a poison center. Afghanistan, Bahrain, Djibouti, Libya, Palestine, Somalia, and Yemen. And the ones that did not respond to us were Pakistan and Jordan. Now, um, you know, even the ones that responded to us, again, there was always a bias with the interview, possibly, but still we were able to get some data from them that I will share with you. Here's what I found out. 84% of countries with a poison center have a poison center. So 16% of countries that have a poison center do not even have a call center, which means an operator that answers the phone, you know, like somebody to pick up the phone and take care of the call. 61% of countries with a poison center are open 24 hours a day, which means 39% of countries with a poison center close at night. 76% of countries with a poison center are open seven days a week which means 24% are closed on the weekend. And 90% of poison centers that have a call center take a call from the public, which means 10% do not take calls from the public. I remember what Dr. Lopez said, the goal is to get to a place where you're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you take calls from the public and from healthcare professionals. Interestingly, we found that 38% of poison centers have an inpatient treatment unit, which is recommended by WHO. I personally don't necessarily think you must have a unit. I think you should be affiliated with the hospital, but I don't think you should necessarily have hospital beds with you. This is just my opinion, but in the Embro region, 38% have an inpatient treatment unit. And, on, and this, more importantly, 77% of poison centers that have a poison center collect data. So only 77%, so 23% that have a call center, they don't collect the data. They, they, they, don't, they don't keep the data, which is, to me is very, very important. Data is so important. And even if they did collect data, these 77% they collect data, they don't report it to the public. There's no, they don't do anything with it. 15% only report it to the public. 85% do not share it with the public, which means that they collect the data, but they don't do anything with it at least for the public or the other researcher to use. And finally, 63% of countries with a poison center 
have a toxicologist, which means 37% do not have a medical toxicologist, which is what Dr. Lopez talked about, the need of a medical physician to be involved in the medical cases, complicated medical hospital cases that need diagnosis and treatment. Now let's look at the scores. This is just a difficult slide to look at. I'll help you look at it briefly. Just look at the mean score achieved across the 13 poison centers that we interviewed. This is, doesn't include everybody. If you look at everybody, you have a lower score. But I only looked at the ones that had a poison center. And you find that their scores, their mean scores, and you see the possible maximum score of 11. So 7 out of 11, 2 out of 3, 0.6 out of 1, 4.5 out of 6, 1.5 out of 2, etc. Now this is, you know, data that is difficult to uh, conclude anything from it. It's better for you to look at it this way. These are the scores per poison center. On the y-axis, you find the number of poison centers that had that score. On the x-axis, you find the actual score. And when you look at this, what do you see? You see that our region is heterogeneous. Some centers have high scores, some centers have low scores. There is widespread of our scores. Why is that? Because our region is different. We have countries with advanced resources and others that are in war, that have been in conflict, have no resources at all. Naturally, they will have a lower score. And this spread of our scores really tells me that our region needs to help each other out to move everybody to the right and make that spread narrow. Because look at this minimum score of 12 with a max of 35 out of 36. Clearly, we can do better to have our minimum move up to the right and make our bell-shaped curve narrow. And that should be done in the future. And this data proves that the region is very heterogeneous and the poison center capabilities are also not, uh, not established well in every country. And again, this is based on our interviews with these people over the phone, which is limited by their subjective bias. And if you, they, they can tell me something that may not be confirmed. I may not be able to confirm what they tell me over the phone. So that's the poison center survey. What about the toxicologists that we surveyed? Remember, we had 32 respondents out of 56. We found that, again, there are physicians and pharmacists, primarily. We do have some with PhD degrees, master's degrees, in addition to a pharmacy or an MD degree. We found that, in general, they attend uh, continuous professional development conferences, like today, like this conference and belong to professional organizations. Luckily for us, 21 were members of Minatops. In terms of what they do every day, in terms of professional activity, it was refreshing to see that most of these toxicologists were actually involved in clinical toxicology. That's good, So, because this is what we are striving to, to, to work with, are these clinical toxicologists that are providing care advice for poisoning patients, and they are actually directly managing patients at the bedside. Because we, you know, we're always worried about toxicologists that are calling themselves clinical toxicologists, but they don't do any clinical care, right? So at least our survey had respondents that were actually taking care of patients. They also were conducting research. That's refreshing and good to know that they're involved in research and education. The majority of them were affiliated with, with, with a poison center, although there were some affiliated with medical schools, residency programs, and pharmacy schools. When we asked about compensation, it was concerning to me to find that only 20 out of 32 were compensated for their work as a toxicologist. So 12 of them were not getting paid for being a toxicologist, which is not acceptable in my opinion. And when you asked them about their compensation, a good number felt that they were not compensated sufficiently. So there's a need for better compensation for clinical toxicologists in the region. They were also not very satisfied with their clinical work that they're able to do. They're not satisfied with their clinical services they are able to provide because of their job, their setting. Some of them were more satisfied than others, but there was a good chunk that was dissatisfied. And when you ask them about their future needs, again, compensation was a word for money. 
recognition, which is also important to government, their job, their boss, recognizing their value. And then again, better development of, uh, of their career in research as well as education. So I think, you know, this is a survey, again, we can take it with a grain of salt. It's only 32 out of 56 uh, surveyed individuals. It is subjective, it does have self-reporting bias. You know, we asked them a question in the survey or over the phone that maybe they did not understand very well. They may have given us an answer that we did not capture properly. But at the, at the same time, this is data that can help us look at the future with a baseline and improve from that baseline. Um, unfortunately, we could not get two countries, Jordan and Pakistan, despite multiple efforts. Maybe in the future we can get those surveys filled by those two polling centers where we can update our data. But it seems that our polling centers have some activities that are worth mentioning. In Tosco Vigilance, there are free services. They're not charging money for their service, which is good. They have information databases like toxins or micromedics or talk space, they have resources, which is good. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't look like they have a lot of uh, uh, data collection and data analysis and publication. And they don't really uh, utilize medical toxicologists commonly in their, in their structure. And they're not really operating properly as a call center available seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And last but not least, it's so valuable across countries in the region. So I think the future, for the Emu region holds more coordination between the countries. As you saw, some countries have better resources than others. Perhaps these countries can help these other countries that have less capabilities to move them to the right. That way that bell-shaped curve can become narrow-based. I also propose that MENA Talks uh, gets involved in the process where we can certify the proposal centers in the country, in the region. Certify them not to accredit them, from a legal perspective, more like give them an assessment that is in person, not over the phone, so we can really assess properly what are the capabilities. This assessment would give that country a score that they can potentially build on and improve over the following years. I hope Minatox can maybe lead this charge in our region, because we really believe that poison centers save money, save lives, and we cannot just live with what we have and not improve on it. I feel that our poison centers in the region, some of them are, you know, they have a status of a poison center, they have some resources and they just, sub, you know, survive with these resources and they don't expand their capabilities. I think an effort like this can push them to get better. So I hope, you know, you can share with us your thoughts during the panel. Hopefully you can maybe uh, do some projects in the future that move the needle forward and then uh, get us better data and the next time we do this stuff. So uh, hopefully you can join us at Abu Dhabi, January 11 to 14 for Mina Talks by Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kozia, for a nice presentation. And you mentioned we have lots of stuff to take to getting a abbreviated and developed poison control center. So I would like to have some comments and questions from the audience uh, to, to our experts. Also, yeah. Uh, also, Dr. Badjo Hatali, Dr. Mohamed El Amin, you are invited to come here to answer uh, some questions from the audience. I'll start with a question to the audience. Can you raise your hand if you ever called the Turkish poison center? Okay, can you share your experience? Can we give the microphone, please? And, and this is just, we're not criticizing, we're just trying to get some an understanding. No problem. Okay. And we can build on it. We want to be positive, we're not being negative. Right. I believe most of the audience have already called the poison centers in Turkey. But the major problem in Turkey is not to uh, achieve the necessary information about poisoning. The most important problem we're facing with the poisoning centers is the experiences they're gathering from the uh, field. And I don't know if it's the same in other countries or not, but here in Turkey we can achieve all of the information from our textbooks online, from uh, uh, toxicology sites or 
anything you'd like to imagine. We're using the very, we're using very much the same archives that you do in other countries, but uh, actually, would you like to uh, tell me again the what was your question first? No, I want to understand like uh, more about your poetry set. Well, when you call them, what do they do? Okay, when you, uh, when you describe a patient on the phone, uh, a person who is assumed to be a nurse or a paramedic or uh, anyone, I don't know who they are, uh, looks up at the uh, curriculum or looks up at the textbooks and then uh, speaks about the experiences and uh, makes some recommendations on the novel, according to the novel therapy of those patients. And uh, he makes suggestions on the phone, and we write down the suggestions on the uh, patient's file. Then we collect those uh, information and uh, send it back to the government. All of the poisoning uh, cases in Turkey are, of course, legal issues, and they have to be reported to the state. And they have to be followed by the state, because they have both uh, physical concerns and psychological concerns about that patient. Uh, actually, it's a very good uh, documentation in Turkey. We feed them the data, but we don't know the results of the data. That's our problem in Turkey. Uh, but I would like to ask a question to you, because that's why I raised my hand at yes. first. I'm going to ask you a question, but <laughs> remind me when you finish, I want to ask you, I will ask you another question. Uh, how those uh, poison centers are being funded in uh, other countries. Who pays for those patients? Oh, I don't right. know. What's the ideal for? Because they must be neutral, they must be objective, and they must be close to any other uh, modification outside. How do you do those funding things? Who pays for those patients? And who pays for all of those uh, data formation and those reports? Thank you. Thank you. We'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Lopez, then Dr. Badria, and Dr. Ahmed for to ask that question. Because we have different countries. Right. A, a very simple question, a very complicated answer. There's 55 poison centers in the United States. We are all funded independently, number one. Number two, some of us receive uh, money from our state health department. Many others don't. All of us have national money, but the national money is very small. Uh, uh, not even 15, 20% of our budget is national money. So a combination of state money, insurance money, um, host institution money. For example, in Georgia, the primary funding comes from the state and it's supplemented with uh, some government money. My colleagues in South Carolina are funded by the School of Pharmacy, and that's all. So there's a, a variety of funding sources. That's why it's so difficult uh, for our country uh, to secure funding, because it comes from so many different sources, not just one. Dr. Ian? So for funding in the UK, um, we have four centers. Um, and uh, working within one network and the funding is central, it's by commission from the Department of Health, the equivalent of would be the Ministry of Health here in Turkey. Um, the funding is basically a grant which is given every year on a regular basis and divided amongst the four units. Um, but again, we have similar financial challenges. Our funding has been stuck at 3.5 million pounds sterling which is just about 3.6 million US dollars uh, annually, and it's been at that level for the last 10 to 12 years. So in real economic numbers, it's actually gone down because of um, inflation. Um, we have a few contracts here and there, but they don't really make up very much um, money. Um, it's usually just used for small local activities. So it's central funding from the, from the central um, um, government. Having said that, uh, one thing um, which I would have wanted to add here, whereas in the US I'd expect you make much larger savings because you deal with public calls and therefore the volume of calls coming is a large number of calls and we deal with a 
advice to health professionals, um, even though the volume of calls is much less. We're talking about 45,000 calls a year. But um, I actually, my uh, master's uh, dissertation was on just looking at the reductions of patients going to the emergency department from primary care if it's been reduced by speaking to MPIS. And on that alone, we make a saving of, of about £6 million pounds a year to, for the UK government. This, and there are other aspects which we haven't mentioned. So just that is double, pretty much double our budget. So there is still a case whether it's a public speaking to you or health professionals, you can still give um, cost uh, benefit savings to your health system and to your country. Adria? For us, it's uh, entirely com coming from the government and through the Ministry of Health. So there is no external fund except like occasionally we can get like donations from uh, companies that they have obligation to the government to give like you know certain percentage of their income. Uh, but it's all come from the government. Any other countries want to share? I would like to comment on that. Yes. If I may, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, please, please. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't hear the last speaker, but uh, I would like to comment on the fact that it's a it needs a huge amount of money to treat all those patients, and more than that, more money for the prevention of uh, poisoning patients. So uh, I believe this is my personal belief. Some of the budget uh, must be funded by the industry. Because uh, most of the toxicology cases are uh, are as a result of pharmacovigilance, and those uh, industry uh, contributions should be, uh, in a way, uh, uh, be promoted. I don't know how they will make it, but the uh, state cannot take all of those expenses on its own in any of the countries. So budget is the most important thing. The, the problem is that we cannot have the necessary amount of staff working for those poison centers. We need education programs, we, not, we need uh, data, we need uh, uh, technology for all those poison centers. So both the state and the industry, I believe, this is my belief of course, must be co-partners co and, and pay for those uh, cases. Uh, I suggest that, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a good idea actually in uh, some, some states, maybe Gero, you can talk about that, they do that. Many of us have tried that pathway of connecting with industry and uh, with drug manufacturers and they just turn the blind eye to this and say continue to do your work but we don't have money. We've gone even as far as suggesting uh, but changes to some of the packaging and manufacturers resist this for one reason and one reason alone. It costs them more money to interrupt the current uh, production cycles to make products more safer. We, we ran into this problem many years ago with uh, an, uh, ethylene glycol poisoning, you know, putting bittering agents or putting, you know, more safer caps. So it, it's, it's a challenge. We've even gone to insurance companies. It's insurance companies that are getting the most benefit, but yet when we go, when we go to you know, our major insurance carriers, they all claim poverty, and they all tell us they don't have money, yet we're saving them tens of millions of dollars each year, and very few of them contribute. So those challenges are, are still existing, for those of us who have contracts with companies, like before in the past I had a company that provided us all their data sheets and their safety information, and for a fee, I would be their 24-hour uh, poison center for all their products. They would pay me a fee, and then I would deliver a service. But the fee would be very small. We talk about the UK uh, budget of uh, $4 million for four centers. My budget for my center alone is almost five million. Just me. So uh, I'm fortunate that my state is very supportive. So my, 
because of all the programs I'm able to deliver to Department of Health, yes, they give me money, but it's very slow in coming. And I also believe that um, uh, the Rocky Mountain Poison Control Center has contracts with industry. Like what you said, they serve as a call center for their emergencies. Somebody drinks their product or something they call the Rocky Mountain Poison Center. I know. Um, I have a question actually for uh, that we discussed that the role of poison centers in developing countries. So uh, I just wonder about that. WHO, uh, maybe you know the answer, but WHO I think did not get get uh, much uh, keep in touch with the societies of chemical toxicology or ACM like many talks. So do you think this is a uh, this is a limitation for the developing countries so that they can have a standard like business control centers? Because I think the WHO should be most involved with the, the societies of professionals like uh, medical toxicologists, clinical toxicologists. But I think there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a not a connection directly between societies so that that affects the uh, power of medical toxicology in region and also they affect the role of poison centers. What do you think? Um, how much? Do you want to answer that question? I think, I'll, I'll take the first step and then Hamad can comment. Uh, I mean, let me take the first step and Hamad you can comment after that. So, WHO is a World Health Organization and you know, is very careful, cautious with their relationship with other organizations. And Minatox has started a relationship with them several years ago, maybe as early as uh, 2007 in uh, Dubai, when we had uh, Dr. Joanne Tempalski, who was leading the International Chemical Program for, Sa for, International Chemical Program for Safety, ICPS, uh, for WHO. And uh, we've improved our relation to now, we've built a relation, but they're very cautious. WHO does not have funding. They don't fund, just, they don't fund anything. They can help you identify some resources. They can, if you have an idea, they can maybe find funding for it from a foundation or a donor. Uh, but they're very slow. Uh, I think they can help by, uh, you know, like I said, these guidelines saying that, you know, we need to have clean air, clean water, we need to eliminate elemental mercury, recycling, uh, recycling of bad, lead acid bad batteries. You know, this gives us a role, you know, gives us, uh, you know, importance. How much we work with WHO as well? So, um, I think on that point with WHO, it, it's tricky because the trouble with these organizations is that um, WHO is pretty much a very governmental organization. And as we've pretty much realized from this morning onwards, Medical or clinical toxicology is a very small um, specialty. So, if you think about it, the first WHO guidelines on establishing a poison center they were published in 1997, so nearly 25 years ago. Uh, when it came to updating the content of the actual book, it changed tremendously because the preparation involved. Um, in itself was a huge exercise because you were moving away from areas where WHO had its very focused relief, um, epidemics, infectious diseases to a new area as you rightly mentioned, chemical exposures and, and, uh, and so on. And because of the nature of these organizations, they're very, very slow moving. There's other politics at play which, which will uh, make things and so on. Certainly when we had the guidelines um, meeting, there wasn't necessarily official representation of society. It's not just Melotox, but um, EPAC from Europe, from the, um, the United States. It was largely select um, uh, poison centers. Um, myself, I think I was pretty much chosen because it so happened we had a grant with Global Health uh, in assisting setting up poison centers in, in Ethiopia. And it was just that the white person knew the white person said, well, you might want to ask so and so to come on. So uh, uh, this is one of the problems with, with these huge international organizations, unfortunately. Okay, Dr. Yashim, she has the hand first. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you. 
uh, I have a question about the uh, information uh, source resources uh, of the poison centers, uh, information databases. Uh, especially in university funded uh, poison centers like uh, ours, uh, we have a, a problem about the uh, subscription fees uh, of the, uh, uh, this type of databases like uh, poison uh, uh, Our university cannot uh, pay uh, uh, this uh, price uh, subscription fee for two, two years and uh, almost uh, 20,000 uh, US dollars uh, a year annual fee. We pay uh, even more. You know, Poisonex is owned by Clarivate Analytics. But just, it is just for five users. We, we, we pay like something like 80, 90,000 dollars per year. We have five, five users and now we, we stop uh, this, uh, this. There uh, are other options there. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, Mohammed or some. Uh, some, uh, talk yeah, you, you talk space. You mentioned about the talk space. So, uh, but uh, I know the uh, poison next is uh, so user friendly. But I don't know. I I, I haven't tried uh, the talk space. Can, can you uh, uh, detail uh, give some details about the talk space and other uh, options? Thank you. Right. Um, am I allowed to pitch of? It's not commercial advertisement. No, it's okay. I think this is a learning session. So, so basically, with with Talkspace, um, you, uh, if I'm speaking for Talkspace, you you do have a few options, uh, and I suspect you can use them not just for Talkspace but for other resources. Um, if Turkey is a member of the Hinali program, that should provide you with free access to Talkspace. I think. I might be wrong, but it might also provide you with free access to toxins as well. So uh, you should be members of Hinari, H I N A R I, uh, because I, because, I, because I think your um, I think if my quick Google check is correct, um, Turkey is in the list for um, Appendix One, which. Um, the low resource countries which should have this free access. So it's worth checking that. With Talkspace, the other um, option, well, there are two other options. Um, there's a personal option for professionals where you can just download the app, whether you, it's an Apple phone or Android phone you use, and the app just costs about seven um, sterling pounds, just under $10 a year. Um, it doesn't have the full a range of 14,000 compounds, but it will have the most common compounds in poisoning. So that will be useful particularly for the um, junior doctors. And certainly departmental um, subscriptions, um, they are, uh, and I hope I'm allowed to say this, they're probably a lot more cheaper compared to poison decks. Um, Toxins, is, yeah, so Turkey is not in the, is not in the Hinari. It's actually listed in the Turkey's listed. Let me double check it. I'm sorry, I'll check it. Uh, they mentioned that Toxins, which is uh, based in New Zealand at um, Dunedin, um, and they have a, a reasonably priced, uh, excellent um, data birth center that you can get access to. to they can give you probably like five or six uh, subscriptions for about six, seven thousand dollars per year. Uh, Turkey is listed as a lower and upper middle country, not included in the Hinari list. Lebanon as well is there. Lebanon and Turkey are the same. Um, but we can we can help you with that because you know the editor of Toxins is one of our graduates. Uh, Toxpace, you have Hamid Amin, who's one of the on the editorial board. You know, Micromedics you already know about. That's it, these are the three main ones. Uh, so we can help you with that easily, we can connect you with C. But you do need information resources, and you need an electronic medical record. You need something to enter the data. And that can be developed locally in Turkey, or you can uh, buy one of the ones that are out there. That also can cost money as well, so that's another piece of your budget. Yes. Can you, can you introduce yourself? Oh. 
He's a first-year medical student, so give him a hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kazi. Uh, firstly, I have a question about the uh, poison center in the USA. Ha, uh, okay, my name is Yichan, but we, we met. Uh, oh, for everybody. Uh, yes. Uh, and I'm a first year in the medical student, as a medical student. Um, the Mr. Lopez uh, has mentioned about uh, poison center, uh, why is the important um, uh, countries. And uh, he do examples uh, from the Georgia, Hawaii, and Alaska. And I wonder about that. Uh, what is the role of the poison center uh, education of uh, poisoning um, to person in USA? Uh, for example, to prohibit the poisoning. And uh, do you give a lecture in USA or Georgia, Atlanta to prohibit a poisoning like plants or mushrooms? Uh, what? what you say about us. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Tan. This is a good question about our education department. So, as I mentioned, the education piece is almost as important as the treatment piece. And so, we have two branches of education, professional education and public education. So, Dr. Morgan, Dr. Kazi, Dr. Diolano, Dr. Kieran, and many of my colleagues from the medical toxicology side provide plenty of lectures uh, across the state, across the region, advanced hazmat, uh, specific requests that may come from a hospital. I myself will travel around our state and do lectures and uh, do specific grand rounds for uh, hospitals. And then from the public side, we are also very involved in providing information through health fairs through, through um, uh, lectures to community groups, and then also very active on social media. So there's a lot of education that is shared, and it is quite important to also do prevention education. As I mentioned, uh, not getting a call is just as important as getting a call. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, as I understand, the Poison Center is very necessary for the medical health, right? Absolutely, and public health. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Tati. We've got two more questions. We have another like 10 minutes, so we're going to try to answer them quickly. Hi, my name is Sonia Kusum. I am from Cardiff Technical University. Thank you. I'm after my talk uh, 24 hours uh, shift, yes. Uh, I'm in a uh, emergency residence in Cardiff Technical University. Uh, in his speech, uh, Mr. Lopez said that um, in different states, there is different kinds of number of um, poisoning centers. And which kind of uh, information do you use to decide how many do you have in a state? Is it based on the, based on uh, patient's uh, frequency or is it based on the population? And thank you all for uh, sharing your uh, precious experience with us. Thank you, Mr. So, Dr. Kazi, can you... So, uh, how does uh, the volume, how do you determine how many police centers you have in the state? So, the first thing to know is that the 55 police centers um, are under the guidance of a major organization. We all belong to the national organization called American Poison Centers. We have guidelines, what should be the minimum population a poison, if you're gonna call yourself a poison center, you have to have a minimum population of one million people that you serve. And so your service area, in, in this case the state of Georgia, we feel that only one poison center is necessary because the, the, the National Association says you should handle no more than 13 million per one poison center. So our state has about 11, so only one poison center needed. In California, the population is much more, so they have four poison centers. Texas, much bigger than Georgia, they have six poison centers. And so the determination of the region for us was that we have almost 11 million, we could, we could do it with one state. So for us, that was the formula, I have to have as many people to cover 24 hours based on my 11 million. So in one day, our center 
probably answers about 300 calls per day, 24 hours. And so that's, that's where we get our volume. It took us a while to get to the point that we are now. I mean, back in what the 70s and 80s, we had even more poison centers um, in our country. There's even there's more in our, in our state. Although some of them, we've got a, really before a good certification process got on there. Some of them would just be a emergency department nurse looking up um, in micromedics and giving out a, giving out an answer um, when she has some time in between seeing her patients she's taken care of. Uh, and we've had a rash of closings different times over the years. Whenever funding would dry up, federal funding, things like that. Um, but now we've kind of settled down for a while at, at this number where we are. And, and one comment, uh, Dr. Morgan makes a good point. When I first started in 1987, there were over 68 poison centers. So they, they have shrunk. But his point about in Georgia, before 1970, there were over 200 places in Georgia that call themselves a poison center. Over 200. The state recognized that that was not manageable and said we need to centralize poison information. And at our hospital, they decided to, to give us the only funding that came from the Department of Health. So everybody else closed, but like Dr. Morgan said, you would, you would be able to call yourself a poison center if you had micromedics. If you had one micromedics copy, and you answered the telephone, you, you could call yourself a poison center. But that's not a poison center. But that's not a poison center. So, so for follow-up, for uh, consistency of treatment, it's only, you know, it's best to, to have one or two in a region, but we feel for the money, you only need one poison center for the 11 million people that we have. And even our region here now, today, you have to be careful what is called a poison center. Okay? Like, I said, like you saw in our research, they say they're a poison center, but you know, they're not, they don't have a call center. How can they be a poison center without a call center, for example? Or they don't have uh, a database, or they don't have, uh, they're not open all the day. So it's important to think about that. And we, and we collaborate with each other somewhat, you know, it kind of depends. Like we have good relationships with poison centers in our area in the United States, and we can provide, cover their services as there's a disaster, or they're having a, a big team meeting or something like that. And there's poison centers in, in different states, um, like California, that only one of them will take all the calls at night. So you can, you know, get economies of scale, and you're not as busy at night, so you'll need all four poison centers to be open. This one of them will be and take all the calls. And I think that's something that you guys do in the UK as well. If there are no more questions, oh, there have one last question, and then we're gonna go to coffee break. Okay, thank you. My name is Pilge. I'm a fifth grade student in medical school. Talking about collecting data is quite important, especially for the poison and toxicology. In Turkey, we have lack of collecting data, and we still struggling with that. Um, for example, in your countries, how could you manage in the first place collecting data? Uh, where you have already a system, or you need to develop a new one? Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Kazi mentioned earlier an electronic medical collection, uh, you know, type uh, program is necessary. For the 55 poison centers in the United States, we all submit our data nationally. So there are exist in existence maybe five data collection programs in the United States. All of the poison centers have one of those five, and then in real time, every six minutes all the data feeds into the national center so that we have national data. So that happens every six minutes. Every center collects and then every center sends their data. And so that's where we get the pool, but it's because there are, you know, like I said, a handful of electronic medical record system. When I first got to Georgia in 1988, we had only a, a, a manual sheet. We, we had a, a data collection that was just on an eight and a half by 14 paper. And then we would enter it into Excel. That's all. But now it's way more sophisticated. And in, in our country, all to be accredited, all poison centers must feed their data 
into one central database for upload so that we know. And then individual states uh, have their own reports. And then that, that data then gets fed into CDC, um, the US government, and they monitor it in real time and have shown success in finding outbreaks um, that are going on that you know, a local center may not necessarily know um, is occurring you know, regionally or even nationally. Um, if, if, if it, from, and our, our fellows get experience with that because that's one of the places where they rotate through. Thank you everyone for your attention, so we can move on uh, our coffee break and then get back to the, for the last section. Thank you so much. Thank you. So welcome everyone again uh, to our last session and I will talk about the general management of poison patients. I have no disclosure. So my objectives are introduce basic medical toxicology approach for emergency physicians, and provide the fundamentals of general management of poison patients. So everything can be toxed. Altered or agitated patient, acidotic patient, hypotensive or hypertensive patient, hypothermic or hyperthermic patient, tachycardic or bradycardic patient. So what's important that we need to get a proper history from the patient or its relatives. So what's our five uh, need, need to ask WH questions? The first question is who? We need to get information about patient's age and weight. Weight because we need to calculate the amount per kg so that we can decide if it is toxic or not. So, so the second question is what? Uh, the name and the dose of the medication and ingested amount is essential to decide that it's a toxic ingestion or not. So we need to ask when because the time of ingestion uh, can determine the peak serum levels so that we can decide the onset of the clinical symptoms. Uh, sometimes if it's the multiple ingestions, the time of ingestions can vary and it affects the serum peak levels. So the other question is where? We need to know the route for exposure to decide which decontamination technique that we need to apply to our patient. And the last but not least question is why? Because uh, we need to decide if it's an intentional or an unintentional overdose. Because if it's an intentional overdose, even the exposure is uh, non-toxic, we have to consult with psychiatry. So what, how we can get to his, the history details? Uh, the patient himself, or friend, uh, patient's friends, family, or the EMS person who found the empty pill containers. Also, previous medical history, uh, and, and we need to check the patient's electronic data to uh, his or her prescriptions can uh, provide us uh, many information. Also, it's good to know the occupation and, and environment of the patient. So, as a toxicology exam, Every patient need, every single patient needs systemic uh, physical examination. But when it comes to a quick toxicology exam, we need to check complete vital status, vital signs, including glucotest, that's like glucotest. Also, we need to check the skin color, temperature, of, or is there any sweating or any dryness. We need to check the pupil size uh, in terms of to decide if there's any toxidrome findings. Also, we need to check the bubble sounds and bladder function. Uh, this uh, help uh, will decide if there is an anticholinergic toxidrome or not. So, as to neurology examination, uh, additionally, we need to check the reflexes, the tremors, tone, and the clonus in, uh, in terms of any uh, toxicologic syndrome. So we have lots of toxicologic syndromes, we call them toxidromes, and the next presentation will be about the toxidromes, that's why I just mentioned the headlines of the toxidromes. So the most common toxidromes are sympathomimetic, anticholinergic, cholinergic, opioids, sedative hypnotics, vitronal syndromes, also we can include serotonin syndrome and neurotic many syndrome, many syndrome into these toxidromes. So I would like to focus on the basic steps of the medical management of poisoned patients. So the first step is safety. 
So we need to protect ourselves. If there is a severe uh, suspicion, we need to wear uh, appropriate PPE, protective personal equipment. So the second step is discontinuation of the exposure. So we need to remove the patient from the exposure, and especially if it's the inhalation exposure, or if the patient uh, gets contaminated with dermal contamination, so we need to remove all clothes and check for the pads. pads. The other step is ABC and stabilization of the vitals. If patient is unrespo unresponsive, uh, the first thing that we need to check the pulse. If there is no pulse, we need to perform CPR as in the show in uh, ACLS protocol, but there are some, some quite uh, different uh, from the normal ACLS protocol. So he, as you know that toxicology toxins are the reversible cause of the cardiopulmonary arrest. So we have to perform prolonged CPR to these patients. Also, we need to consider for extracorporeal membrane oxy oxygenation machines uh, for intoxicated arrest patients. Uh, also, we need to consider to apply antidotal therapy uh, in poison patients. But the thing is that using antidotal therapies in uh, overdose uh, restation, there are, the evidence are really limited. So we, uh, we consider giving antidote for limited conditions, such as what? Tricyclic antidepressants, local anesthetic toxicity, digoxin toxicity, and some of them can, we can consider some ammonimation, especially snake ammonimations. So if the patient is unresponsive, but if there is a pulse, so we need to check A and B. Uh, as you know, uh, we need to optimize the position clear the suction airway, and if there's a respiratory depression or respiratory arrest, the first thing that we need to consider to give patient Narcan, I mean Naloxan, which is the antagonist of opioid receptors. As the uh, in previous uh, guidelines, we can use flumazine prophylactically, but now it's not considered as a prophylactic uh, usage, because if the patient is a, a chronic benzodiazepine, a, a chronic benzodiazepine, uh, use uh, patients, flumazenic can cause white travel syndrome. So that's why if there's a respiratory depression and arrest, first uh, thing that we need to apply is naloxone. The general assessment of the C, yeah, <coughs> I mean circulation, we need to check the blood pressure, pulse rate, and rhythm. So we need to get optin EQG first 10 minutes and we need to evaluate it as soon as possible. Also, we need to put secure venous access, draw blood for the diagnostic tests, uh, and also if there is a need, we need to begin IV infusion. Depending on clinical findings, we have to stabilize the patient's vitals. The other step is assessment and evaluation of decontamination. So we have two main decontamination techniques, the external surface decon and internal GI decon. Uh, the other, uh, uh, other presentation will be about decontamination and enhanced elimination techniques, so I just want to, uh, just want to uh, point the headlines. So in external decon, it includes skin and eyes decontamination. As to internal decontamination, it includes gastric lavage, activated charcoal, and whole bone irrigation. The next step is monitorization of the patient and the, uh, obtaining diagnostic tests. So observation of the vital signs uh, is really important, especially if the exposure is toxic exposure. Uh, it's, it's essential to put the patient in continuous cardiac monitorization, depending on the agent. So when we draw some blood samples from the IV secure line, uh, we can send some biochemistry tests. Uh, we can consider the met uh, metabolic condition with uh, venous blood gas, or if there's any hypoxia, we can uh, consider the test arterial blood gas. We need to check carbon carboxyhemoglobin levels if, it's, if there's any suspicion. Also, uh, every uh, female patient, we need to send a uh, beta HG for the pregnancy. And also, if there is a metabolic acidosis, we need to check the anion gap and osmolar gap uh, to detect if there is any suspicion of toxic alcohol uh, exposure. 
So when we, when we send specific levels, if there's a history or a suspicion, clinical sus suspicion, we can send specific levels. These tests are uh, available for most of the centers. So we can check the serenity level, the joxin level, valproic and carbamazepin level, most of the hospitals. For an intention overdose, it's essential to send uh, paracetamol level because as you know paracetamol is the most common single agent uh, agent uh, all of the exposures and the clinic always is silent so we if we get if we misdiagnose APAC toxicity uh, there will be a lots of complications such as hepatic failure so every intentional exposures we need to check uh, APAP levels if it is available but uh, this is for our country because most of the outside like uh, uh, North, uh, North America uh, countries uh, the most common second agent is salicylic acid uh, so they can check the uh, uh, salicylic levels uh, in every intentional overdose but in Turkey salicylic levels are not available and they are not most common uh, seen exposures. So as to EKG, we said that please update EKG every patient in 10 minutes and evaluate it, check the rhythm, check the QRS, QRS prolongation. If the QRS is greater than 100 milliseconds, we need to consider about sodium channel blockade. So what is the sodium channel blockade findings in EKG? Uh, in AVR, R value is greater than uh, 3 mm. As you see in, the, in this picture, in this EKG, this is a typical sodium channel blocker EKG. As you see, the QRS is greater than 100 milliseconds. And when you see this pattern, you need to check directly AVR duration. As you see uh, in AVR duration, R wave is greater than 3 mm. Also, we have to check QTC uh, prolongation. Uh, as you know, uh, if there is a prolonged QTC, there is a risk for ventricular, ventricular uh, dystrophy. So when we use uh, ultrasound uh, for uh, overdose patients, if uh, we use the ultrasound, a special differential diagnosis of high potential, because sometimes some agents can cause cardiogenic shock and some agents can cause distributive shock, it's essential to determine with uh, bedside ultrasound. Uh, and uh, evaluate patient with echo or venical index to start which uh, supportive therapy is appro appropriate for this patient. So that's why we can use ultrasound uh, for uh, evaluation. Also, we can use X-rays if uh, the patient exposures are due to metals or if the pa patient is a body packer. So X-rays can show us uh, the packages in the GI uh, GI tract. As to brain CT, we don't use brain CT in our routine, but however, if there's some, uh, if, we, if we are considering the uh, secondary complications due to carbon monoxide, methanol, or anticoagulants, or sympathomimetics, we can get a brain CT, brain CT to detect uh, secondary complications in terms of hemorrhage or infarct. As to treatment, we have three main uh, treatment steps. These are antidotal therapies, enhanced elimination methods, and supportive therapy. As you know, most of the therapies in uh, medical toxicology is supportive therapy because we have limited antidotal therapies. And the common antidotes are, uh, must be known by every emergency medicine physician. So this is the common antidote list, uh, as you see, uh, Paracetamol's antidote is NAC, opioid is naloxone, snake bars antivenoms, benzos antidote is flumazenine, cholinergic syndrome antidote is atropine and auxins, anticholinergic syndrome uh, antidote uh, is pyzostigmin, local anesthesia is uh, interleptic emistrum therapy, serotonin syndrome is ciprofactinin, and you can see the, all these lists, and the thing is that this list is limited. Uh, so we have to be uh, we have to be aware of that is uh, about specific antidotal therapies. As to enhance elimination methods, there are three main methods. These are multi-dose activated charcoal uh, for the substance who undergoes enteropathic circulation. The second is urinary alkalinization. 
uh, for the toxic substance whose PK, uh, uh, PK uh, levels are acidic, uh, such as salicylates, metotrexates, and phenobarbs, we can cause the urinary alkalization, uh, the mechanism, as you know, the, uh, the ion trap, but uh, the next presentation will, uh, uh, will provide the detailed information. Also, we have to consider about extracorporeal techniques, such as hemodialysis and hemoperfusion. As to supportive treatments, uh, as you know, the supportive treatments uh, has the most part of the uh, medical management. So if the patient sees due to uh, toxin, uh, toxin uh, exposure, the first line therapy is benzos. And we need to keep away from the antiepileptics, especially phenytoin. Uh, if the patient is tachycardic, we always uh, follow the ACLS guidelines. However, most of the tachycardias are due to uh, sample to mimetic activation, so uh, for the tachycardia, we can use benzodiazepines to manage the patient. As to bradycardic, if the patient is bradycardic, we also always follow the ACLS guidelines, uh, such as atropine, inotropes, pacemakers. However, if this is due to a specific condition, we need to consider other antidotal therapies and uh, other uh, uh, pharmacologic agents. If the patient is, has uh, agitation and hallucination, first line therapy is benzos. If the patient is hyperthermic, aggressive cooling can work, and also benzos can work uh, for this uh, hyperthermic complication. If the patient is hypotensive, we can consider the fluid resuscitation, vasopressors. Uh, as I mentioned, ultrasound is the best way to detect which uh, pharmacologic treatment is the best for the patients. So we need to check the patient's echo and the vinical index. Uh, as a hypertension, uh, the first line therapy uh, we consider is the benzos, especially if the hypertension is due to sympathomimetics or anticholinergics. We don't consider antihypertensive agents as our first line therapy. As to observation periods, if the patient has normal labs, normal EKG, normal exam, no history of extended release drug, we approximately absorb patient six hours and then we discharge uh, if there is any indication for psychiatric evaluation. If the uh, exposure is uh, extended release medication, or bopropion, or oral hypoglycemics, or antidistributive medications. Even patient is asymptomatic, we need to absorb patient at least 24 hours. And always you can call poison control centers to get help, but it's, uh, it's good to have a medical toxicologist around your hospital. But if you are available, the first thing that you can do is call your uh, medical toxicologist. But also poison control centers can help to make decisions about the patient's medical management. These are my references. Thank you so much for your attention. So the next speaker is Dr. Mehmet Tatlı from Training Hospital. He is a consultant in emergency medicine and he is a PhD student in neuroscience. Yes, and he will present us uh, toxic drums. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks, Ivan, for a great presentation. Toxidorms today. Uh, uh, I came from one eastern part of Turkey. Uh, the toxidorms uh, are a very important issue, and uh, any toxicology conference uh, cannot be supposed uh, without toxidorms. Uh, this is my presentation plan. Uh, I will talk about toxidorms and the other toxidorms. Anticholinergic toxidorms, cholinergic toxidorms, sympathomimetic toxidorms, serotonin syndrome, opioid toxidorms, and sedative toxidorms. First of all, uh, we need to remember the autonomic nervous system because uh, the toxidorms are involved from uh, the autonomic nervous system. 
and we have sympathetic parasympathetic system. What does sympathetic system do? The fight and flight response, and the parasympathetic system is the, our uh, rest and digest uh, system. In, in uh, stress conditions, uh, the sympathetic system makes the pupil expand, cast eye shallow waves, heart pumps faster, and gut is uh, inactive. On the other hand, the parasympathetic system, pupil shrink, slow deep breaths, heart slows, and gut is active. Uh, first of all, what is toxic syndrome? It actually is the toxic syndrome. Uh, the toxic syndrome by then becomes toxic syndrome. The term was coined in the 1970s by two uh, pediatricians, and they said that some common combination of manifestations which we have to toxic drugs can give up glue to the drugs involved. I mean, uh, we uh, come from uh, the symptoms to the uh, beginning of the toxic drugs. First, uh, I will talk about anticholinergic to toxic drugs. Uh, this was, will be a brief uh, lesson uh, for toxic drugs. Uh, anticholinergic toxic drugs we see uh, very much in the emergencies. Uh, it blocks acetylcholine and muscarinic receptors for peripheral and central. Cold medicines have anticholinergic effects. Toxin presents in plants, and the uh, effects are the opposite of the cholinergics. Uh, it blocks post synaptic receptors and blocking acetylcholines. Uh, it influences central nervous system, heart, lung, salivary gland, gastrointestinal system, sweat glands, and eyes. Uh, in uh, parasympathetic system, you know, uh, rest and digest, but uh, in the anticholinergic toxicity, we will uh, think about, we will suppose about the uh, reverse effects of the cholinergic system. What will happen? Midriasis to non reactive to like dry mucous membranes. Uh, actually, this is the most important part the dry mucous membranes and dry axilla in the physical system. Uh, examination of the toxidrome patient in parasympathetic anticholinergic toxicity, plus seeking urinary retention, constipation, absence of diaphoresis, tachycardia, and altered mental status. Uh, altered mental status uh, are all involved in all the toxidromes we'll see. And uh, we have, uh, all you know, uh, this the blind is a bat, it as a red as a bee, dry skin and flashing, mad as a hatter, Alter mental status, hot as a hair, increased body temperature, dry as a bone, dry mucous membrane. Many drugs have anticholinergic effects, which we use antispasmodics, Parkinson's drugs, antiemetics, antihistamines, <coughs> antipsychotics, and antidepressants. Uh, anticholinergic source, actually, uh, the plants in our Victoria, uh, there are lots of plants that have uh, anticholinergic effects. This is the Atropa no, Meridona. Uh, actually, uh, I think in this region, uh, some of the toxidromes come with Atropa Meridona, which look like uh, berries. This is uh, Black Hamley. Uh, in my region, one, uh, I see this uh, plant to poisoning. Actually, the children uh, like to eat this plant. And the trosphilomonium is in Anatolia very much we see. And I have a, a suicide uh, case with the trosphilomonium. Uh, a, bo a boxer uh, needs to suicide attempts with uh, different ways. First, he comes to the hospital with insulin abuse to suicide and then read in the papers uh, about the Datura and he collect Datura stromonium in the graveyard and then he used and come with uh, anticholinergic toxidrome. And this is, uh, this is actually this is also a Datura and you can see on the landscapes in everywhere in Turkey. Uh, what is treatment? The treatment is always start with supportive treatment like I just said, uh, all, all of the toxidromes. And benzodiazepines for all the agitations, all the ultimate stress, uh, but except uh, hypnostative uh, uh, toxic drugs. 
And uh, Mr. Sutinman is the antidote of the uh, anticholinergic toxic syndrome, but we avoid in uh, antidepressant because of the effects, the cardiac uh, side effects of this isostigmin. And uh, we come to cholinergic toxic syndrome. Uh, what does cholinergic system do? Rest and digest, and increased rest is. is is the rest in peace. Uh, excess acetylcholine, uh, excess rest uh, can uh, bring you to the uh, rest and peace. Excess, of, uh, excess amount of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junctions. Acetylcholine uh, stimulates muscarinic and nicotinic receptors and cause, cause muscle contraction and glandular secretion. You see here, uh, all the taps on the body is opened and uh, you see uh, sweating diaphoresis, lactimation, vanilloids, vomiting, urination, diarrhea, and uh, we see bradycardia. Uh, Colonaries are insecticides, neuroagents, medication, mushrooms. You see, organophosphate and carbamide insecticides, sarigazes, mycelagravis, medicine, and local medicine, and Alzheimer drugs are also can uh, make uh, cholinergic toxidromes. In the emergencies, we see patients, uh, uh, mostly farmers, uh, spray insecticides, organophosphate, carbamates, uh, and they come to the emergency with cholinergic toxidromes after that. And also, children are uh, in a dangerous position in farming places. The mnemonic of the cholinergic toxic syndrome is sludge, uh, dumbbells, salivation, lacrimation, urinary frequency, diaphoresis, gastrointestinal cramping and pain, mazes, diarrhea, urinary frequency, meiosis, bronchospasm, bronchorec, mazes, lacrimation and salivation. And when we have the killer bees, uh, killer bees can, uh, can make you to the rest in peace place of the cholinergic love and they are bradycardia, bronchorea, bronchospasm. If we see these symptoms, we, we must be cautious. And uh, for for life, for uh, preventing death from the cholinergic toxicities, we must stop the bees. Atropine is a drug, uh, is the agent which we all know, and pralidoxin and uh, we use benzodiazepines for all toxidromes. And uh, sympathomimetic toxidrome uh, enhanced sympathetic activity. What does the sympathetic system do? Uh, fight and flight response. We see boosted adrenaline, noradrenaline dopamine activity. And uh, sympathomimetics uh, are cocaine and Metamphetamines, illicit drugs, and some medicine in the, which we use in attestation deficient uh, disorders. And uh, MDA, MDMA ecstasy, the colorful drugs. And we all see uh, bath salts and caffeine. Most of the doctors are in caffeine. Uh, and we will always see. We, we, we will not always see the uh, midriatis because of the poly medicines. Uh, not every time we can see the patients. The most symptoms are hypertension, tachycardia, midriatis, diaphoresis, and agitation in uh, sympathetic uh, toxidromes. There is no antidote for sympathetic toxidromes. The supportive care is always our first treatment. Benzodiazepines for agitations of the patients in the spans of uh, toxic drugs, nitrates for hypertension. We avoid beta blockers for tachycardia because uh, most of the sympathetic uh, sympathomimetics uh, work in alpha uh, agonism uh, met, uh, methods, and if we block with beta blockers, uh, we will see dysrhythmias in these patients. Anticholinergic and sympathomimetic uh, toxic, uh, toxicity, you, you see that they, they look like each other, but uh, the most 
big difference in uh, this toxicity is one is dry and one is wet. This is the most important part of uh, this uh, toxicity. And uh, serotonin syndrome increased serotonin activity in the central nervous system. Uh, it can be uh, we can see this serotonin syndrome in uh, usual medicine, not uh, not always uh, higher amount of serotonin drugs. We see. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, interactions between uh, drugs and intentional self poisoning. Uh, we see mostly mental status changes, and the most important is autonomic hyperactivity and neuromuscular abnormalities. We will see in serotonin syndromes. Uh, medicines and herbals, uh, most of mostly uh, serotonin, the SSRIs, antidepressants, but. In, we, we can see also with the her herbals. This is Sanjor words, uh, and I like uh, to collect them. It, it can help you sleep. Uh, uh, this is uh, a plant in Turkey, and uh, it's also used in Turkey uh, shamanic rituals. Some of them, and uh, they make the tea of uh, this uh, plant. We call in Turkish uzerlik. And symptoms, neuromuscular excitations, clonus, hyperreflexia, neoclonus, and rigidity, autonomic circulation, hypothermia, tachycardia, diaphoresis, tremor, and flashing. And we will see uh, mental state status changes, anxiety, agitation, and confusion. Uh, in, in the clinic, we will see mild symptoms to severe symptoms, and we mostly if uh, they, they didn't come with. Uh, they didn't, maybe they didn't say us. Uh, they use medicine and the male symptoms can confuse us. There are uh, 100 criteria of serotonin syndrome. The most important is the spontaneous clonus. If we see this in a uh, serotonin medicine patient, and we can say that this is serotonin syndrome. If there is no clonus, but there is a tremor and if hyperreflexia, we can also say that this is also a serotonin syndrome patient. And, uh, Ocular clonus or inducible clonus, if there is hypertonia or uh, uh, hypertonia, we, we also say this is a serotonin syndrome patient. And ocular clonus and diaphoresis and uh, also agitation, we, we say that this is a serotonin syndrome patient. What is the treatment of serotonin syndrome? Uh, sportive care, as always, and uh, discontinuation of all serotonin drugs, medicines. Uh, in this uh, therapy, and uh, sedation with benzodiazepines and administration of serotonin antagonist. antagonist. What is that? Uh, Saproheptadine, uh, mostly in pediatrics, they use for loss of appetite. And uh, we also use this medicine in serotonin syndrome. Opioid toxidromes, opioids uh, are well known analgesics during the ancient times and, uh, in this region. Hassan Sabah makes uh, a castle and makes a heaven with this opium poppies. And uh, what does opium poppies do? Relieve pain, diarrhea, and produce euphoria. And sedation and respiratory depressions are uh, the most important clues. <coughs> In the world, 75% of all deaths uh, involved with an opioid. But in Turkey, uh, it's not as much as uh, this. Topics. What are they? Morphine, uh, heroin, codeine, fentanyl, meperidin, and methadone. In the opioid toxicity, there are three, three receptors, two delta and kappa receptors. Most of the attacks are serious, CNS depression, myosis, and decreased respiratory rate. Uh, most of them are with uh, mu receptors, you see. Rules of opioids, all of the rules that you can imagine uh, can be seen in these opioid toxidromes. Treatment is uh, naloxone. Uh, naloxone uh, binds the opioid receptors and uh, after that the opioids cannot bind to that receptor. Uh, we can use IV and nasal uh, 
forms for uh, this toxic drug and support of therapy is always. And opioid withdrawal uh, is the most pathognomonic is uh, goose in opioid withdrawals. And uh, I will talk about sedative hypnotic syndrome. The most important thing is in this syndrome is the GABA agonism. It will, they will make uh, serious depression with the GABA, GABA agonism, but they benzodiazepine is an alcohol. What are the symptoms in this syndrome? Confusion, hypertension, and decreased rate of respiration, and drowsiness, lethargy, and somnolence. We see hypnosepedic syndrome. When you do the other medicines, uh, you see while you at one, you want to treat normative zanax are abused for uh, the in this syndrome. Treatment is for the K-alternate is Flumazani as I understand before, but Flumazani uses controversy because uh, sometimes it can make sizes. Thank you very much. Uh, this is one. It, it has a lake like a sea. And uh, this is the my cat and this is my kitty. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So, next, I have the opportunity to introduce one of my colleagues from Emory, uh, Dr. Jonathan DeAlano. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory University. Dr. DeAlano uh, completed his residency and fellowship training at New York University and Bellevue Hospitals, and currently works at Grady as well as the Georgia Poison Center. All right, thank you. So we're going to talk about um, enhanced GID contamination today, and I'm going to try to create a narrative on the options that we have, the evidence that we have to support it and go against it, and hopefully, ultimately, have you guys decide what you want to do. Because as you're going to find out, the evidence is. So, things that we're going to look at today, we're going to look specifically at uh, serum of the gastric lavage, activated charcoal, multi dose activated charcoal, and whole bowel irrigation. And I'm going to spend the bulk of my time on activated charcoal because that's probably where we have the most evidence there. Uh, and the other ones, uh, the evidence isn't quite as clear. Now, there's a ton of controversy with everything that I'm going to talk about. And there's a joke in toxicology if you have, you know, if you ask five toxicologists, you know, um, how to treat a patient, they're going to give five different answers. And this is an example of that. And it starts with the 1997 position paper by our societies of um, American Academy of uh, Clinical Toxicology and, and our European colleagues looking at decontamination, specifically with activated charcoal. Now you're going to see that. Their recommendations are quite strict in that we should only be giving activated charcoal within one hour of an ingestion. And that's maybe where you've studied when someone comes in for a poisoning that you only receive charcoal within one hour. Unfortunately, we have this paper to blame. And we're going to try to break down this paper and hopefully show you that maybe this isn't the answer. Now, unfortunately, unlike other fields of medicine where we have really good evidence, our field of medical toxicology, we're using case reports, we're using animal studies as a way to build uh, a foundation of knowledge because we don't have those meta-analyses, we don't have those random, randomized controlled trials with good evidence, you know, to be able to support the decisions that we make. So, what is the principle of GI decontamination? What's the whole goal? What we're trying to do here is we're trying to reduce the amount of a drug that's being absorbed. And in certain circumstances, we're trying to actually increase the elimination, which we'll talk about. But the idea is, we're trying to have someone going from that red line over there, which is a lethal dose of a drug, and try to bring them back <coughs> over to the right, try to get them to that purple zone. And if someone comes in and ingests something that is in a toxic dose, maybe we can decontaminate them to the point where they're not going to get toxic. 
Now just think for a second how difficult it's going to be to get a, a whole group of patients that are right at that right spot of the curve and that we're able to bring them back. It's going to be very, very hard to actually prove that with any group of patients, but you can think about an individual in front of you in which actually you took a toxic dose of a substance, I know that you took a toxic dose, we're going to give you something and I just based off, off of the presumption of how the substance works, we're going to bring you further to the right. And by doing this, we're going to try to decrease the bioavailability of a substance. And so these are three curves, um, blue, the blue, red, and, and green, that the only thing that they have different from each other is the bioavailability. So if I'm able to bring someone down from that blue line down to the red line, or from the red line down to the green line, I may decrease the amount of toxicity and potentially death that they, they may have from that injection. So I've kind of mentioned um, the five different modes that we're going to talk about. So let's start with the first one, which is going to be seropipitac. Now, does anybody know seropipitac? Is that used commonly in, in Turkey? It used to be very commonly used in the United States, and according to the American Academy of Pediatricians, every household needed to have this liquid. And basically what it is, it's a, it's a substance that makes your child vomit. So your kid takes a pill, eats a mushroom, eats a flower, you give them the substance and then they throw it out, right? So unfortunately, we don't, well fortunately, it is no longer recommended because we found that a lot of kids are having other issues, so they're having secondary effects from the vomiting, from the induction vomiting. One thing that, we, that we've noticed from taking call from Turkey is that we have a very common practice amongst mothers and, and, and fathers in this country is that when their child ingests a toxic substance, that they will induce vomiting before going to the hospital. And it's something that we're kind of curious to study because we found that a lot of the kids actually come to the hospital asymptomatic. We're not <coughs> arguing that we should be reintroducing, you know, a syrup of attack or introducing induction of vomiting, but it's kind of curious and it kind of makes sense that if the kid actually vomits back up the stuff, it's not going to be toxic. Oh, and one other issue is that one of the complications from syrup attack is that people who would abuse it, such as people with eating disorders and bulimia, uh, suffer from cardiomyopathy as a result of uh, the repeat use of syrup attack. So now let's go with the second step of GI decontamination, again, trying to remove the substance from being absorbed, is gastric lavage, in which we place a large tube into uh, the person's uh, esophagus and into their stomach, and we introduce some fluid, some normal saline, some water, uh, and then remove it and exchange it into the point where whatever the contents that are in that stomach are now clear, uh, and hopefully, by doing so, we're gonna actually remove tablets, okay? Quite simple. We're gonna find that there are gonna be some issues with, with doing this procedure. As you can imagine, these are very large tubes in order to be able to remove pills, and it's often not recommended anymore with rare exception. So who would we do this for? These are people who take a massive injection um, that are thought to be remaining in the stomach, substances that we have very little or not good antidotes at all, um, and that it's not gonna absorb the charcoal. So let's kind of go into the weeds a little bit. And I think this is important because, you know, when you're training as a toxicologist, part of the training is actually reading papers, learning from those papers, learning the limitations of those papers, and then being able to make a judgment. Because again, we're gonna read the same papers, and we're gonna come up with a different opinion, and that's okay. As long as you're basing it off of the data that we do have. So this is an example of a paper which we see no difference by giving someone gastric lavage. Patients come in, some people get gastric lavage, some people don't get gastric lavage, they get charcoal instead. And we find that they do the same. They do equally well or, or poor. Um, unfortunately, in this data, what we have missing is the people that are the most sick are excluded from the study. Huh. So if a patient shows up to your hospital, shows up to your emergency department, who's extremely ill, who takes a massive ingestion of something deadly, they're not gonna be included in this data. 
Let's compare now not giving anything, doing um, cerebral bit fat, gastrocolagic activated charcoal. And again, going back to the idea of we're trying to reduce the bioavailability. This is a, a fun, uh, a fun, I think it's kind of a fun volunteer study. Back when medical students and residents were often the volunteers, um, in which five grams of ampicillin were given, and they were treated as controls. They would just measure their, their uh, ampicillin levels and their serum. They were given syrup of the cat. They were getting gastrolage or activated charcoal. And I hope that you can see on the bottom left there, or your bottom right, um, activated charcoal reduces that, act, that area under the curve the most and reduces the absorption by 57%. Now, let's think about the downsides to everything that we do here. So this is a nice paper that looks at one of the, uh, the negative effects of doing gastric lavage. Again, conceptually, very simple, straightforward. You're removing pills from the stomach. What is the downside? Gastric lavage would increase the ICU admission rate. It's going to increase a patient having an aspiration pneumonia. And it's going to increase the patient's ventilatory requirement. We also see that if you give someone gastric lavage, another downside is that they are, uh, they're going to have a delay in activated charcoal. And we saw just from that graph two, two slides ago, that actually charcoal is probably the best option out of the three. So we always get this question, or we always get this statement, that the patients have had the ingestion more than an hour ago, therefore we're not going to do anything. We're just going to let them ride. We're just going to provide support for care and no gastric contamination. So the question arises, well, what's in the stomach, right? Is everything absorbed or do we have pills left? This is a, a really interesting Japanese study in which if you told the provider or the doctor in the emergency department that you took an overdose, you went right to the GI suite and they did an endoscopy. The ethics of this is a little questionable, but everybody had to get an endoscopy. And they would correlate how many pills you said that you took and when you took them. And they would find that if, I don't know if I have a marker here, but on the top left graph, there were tablets found in someone's stomach up to 30 hours after the ingestion. Okay? 30 hours. So the idea that you should wait only or they should only give charcoal within that one hour is kind of ridiculous. I hope you see that. Right? We haven't even talked about what kind of substances that they took. This is all substances. So it doesn't matter if they took something that might affect your hemodynamics or your GI motility. All substances will slow down in overdose, will slow down your GI motility and cause pill fragments to be remaining in your stomach greater than an hour later. And we know this from other data. Looking, this is Lipschitz et al., this is out of New York, where they looked at people who had died from an overdose. And this is in a medical examiner where they examined the patient after death. And they found that 9% of these patients had stuff in their stomachs. These are dead patients. So these are patients that did not get activated charcoal, did not get GIG contamination, and yet we have pills in their stomach. And so what does this look like? These are examples of massive injections, not decontaminated. We have a massive barabamil on your left, a massive salicylate on your right. We have carbamazepine, this is a bezoar, um, here of a patient in which they needed to actually do an endoscopy to have it removed, which is pretty neat. So now let's talk about activated charcoal. I've kind of hinted at this. But this is the premium or the ideal modality for GIT contamination. And so how does it work? It primarily adsorbs, so binds to the substance that's in your GI tract. And it normally binds at a ratio of 10 to 1. So if you take 10 grams of a drug, it's going to bind to 1 gram. Again, going back to the initial graph, it's going to hopefully bring you to the right of that graph from that lethal dose to the right by one for every 10. Now, there's going to be differences in pH that's going to determine how much is going to bind to a drug. 
But the general idea is that it's a 10 to 1 ratio. So this is going to be the procedure of choice if the substance is appropriate, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Um, the major risk for giving somebody charcoal, and this is important, is that it's an aspiration risk. So someone who is, has a decreased mental status, you're not going to give them active charcoal. Because you're worried that they might regurgitate, they may aspirate, and that could lead to whole uh, other issues. And for most overdoses, especially the sickest overdoses, we want to give this well beyond that one hour mark. As I just showed you with the other data, that there's going to be most likely pills in their stomach if they took something hemodynamically unstable, even more likely. So who do we avoid charcoal? So we have a simple mnemonic called CHAMPS, caustics, things that will injure your esophagus and your stomach. Hydrocarbons, those will get readily absorbed. Alcohols, they don't get absorbed to charcoal. Metals, lead, and salts. Everything else, you want to get charcoal. And this is just a nice, again, demonstration of how charcoal works. So we have, uh, uh, volunteer study in which people get 50 milligrams per kilogram of acetaminophen and they get either 25 or 50 grams of activated charcoal and you can see a pretty dramatic reduction between 23 and 59 percent respectively of the amount of acetaminophen or paracetamol that they are absorbed. <coughs> this is also another uh, <clears throat> healthy volunteer study looking at the ratio between charcoal and the drug and it kind of makes sense that the more the greater the ratio of charcoal to the drug, the more that drug is going to bind to the charcoal. Okay, great, great, we're keeping volunteers. This is where things get messy. When we start using this actually on patients, and we try to study it on patients, we're not gonna see such a clear uh, picture as I'm, as I'm trying to present. And this is a study looking at patients who came in and they were randomized to activate charcoal or not activated charcoal, and they found, huh, there's no significant difference. And we see another randomized control trial in which we also see the same thing. We don't see a difference between people who get charcoal and who don't. But the problem is, it's the data itself, not the problem, it's the data. The, the issue is that we need to look deeper into the data. And the majority of these patients came in after an ingestion of a benzodiazepine or phenobarbital, all of which we know that are pretty well managed with just supportive care. Again, the sickest patients were excluded from this data. So then now let's talk about them. who gets activated charcoal. This is kind of the highlighting points. Patients who have ingested potentially toxic amount of any xenobiotic that can be absorbed by activated charcoal. The ingestion occurred within a time frame amenable to absorption of charcoal. Again, there's no one hour anymore. So we've given charcoal 10, 12, 14 plus hours after the ingestion. And then patients who have a life-threatening toxicity, regardless of the time of ingestion, as long as there's no absolute contraindications. And I think anybody in this room who's taken care of an aspirin overdose has probably dealt with this situation in which you get an aspirin concentration 30 milligrams per deciliter. You get another aspirin concentration four hours later, it's 40 milligrams per deciliter. You get another one while they are, on, at this point, getting uh, bicarb. You get another level and it continues to rise. Well, why is it continuing to rise? There's ongoing absorption. This would be a person who would be intended for more charcoal. So now let's talk about multi dose activated charcoal. And this is the, this is the classic study by Kolig that looked at. How does multi-dose activated charcoal increase our elimination? Not just our absorption, but actually will cause what we call gut dialysis. And this is a dog model in which they were given intravenous theophylline, nothing in the GI tract. And those who got multiple doses of activated charcoal had an increase in the elimination of the drug. And how does this happen? It, it traps the drug as it's undergoing recirculation in the gut. So what evidence do we have to use this? Interestingly enough, we actually have uh, mortality evidence that by giving someone who has an exposure to or, or an ingestion of yellow oleander, multi-dose activated charcoal, it reduces the risk of mortality from 
believe it's 8% to 3%, quite dramatic. And there are larger studies that were based after this uh, that showed a, a general direction towards more, uh, uh, a mortality benefit, uh, but unfortunately it's not been, uh, it didn't, wasn't as, a, as positive as the first study. So now, who do we use now multi-dose activated charcoal? These are generally patients who are life-threatening amounts of carbamazepine, dapsone, phenobarbital, quinine, theophylline, and other drugs. So aspirin being a good example, which you take massive grams worth of a drug, that you may need more than one dose of broke acid in the same way. Last, let's talk about whole bowel irrigation. And these, this is basically flushing out the gut. So you're giving them uh, uh, polyethylene glycol, which is what we normally give for a colonoscopy, and you're just going to flush out the gut. This is generally given for drugs that are extended release, for metals, for body hackers, um, and for large ingestions of schematics that are not absorbed well to that activated charcoal. Now, to do this properly, you want to give them one to two liters of this solution per hour. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is a control case, uh, uh, uh, case control study looking at giving them non-absorbable pellets and one group getting charcoal, sorry, one group getting whole bowel irrigation and one not, and we see that there is a dramatic movement in that, um, in those pellets. So I'm going to finish with one interesting case that I had as a fellow uh, in which we gave them whole bowel irrigation. Now I want you to take a look at this EKG. This is a gentleman who's 47 years old. He's got a history of a, a stab wound to the chest years before, <coughs> who comes into the hospital saying, I don't feel well. You get this EKG, immediately that has a seizure, and he goes into cardiac arrest. So as you're doing CPR, and really good, apparently, really good CPR, you notice that from his rectum, there's a package that is coming out. Anybody have an idea what this might be? This is a massive cocaine overdose. Now you might think, wait a second, cocaine only gives tachycardia. When you, give, when you take enough cocaine, that tachycardia actually becomes bradycardia, and you see the sodium channel blockade, the widening of that QRS from the sodium channel blockade from, uh, from cocaine. And hopefully this works. But he got ROSC after multiple doses of uh, sodium bicarb. And here you can see the, uh, the pellets of cocaine that were found in his GI tract. No, it's not. So he was actually given whole bowel irrigation, and this was all removed from his GI tract. And he survived and walked out of the hospital five days later. All right. Well, thank you very much. If you have any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Romano, for your nice presentation. Any questions or contributions from the audience? So those patients should get multiple rounds of charcoal. Um, in 
the reason is that you want to get that first dose combined to the char to the yellow oleander that's currently in the stomach or the GI tract. And then the every four hours they get another dose in order to remove char sorry, the yellow oleander from the, the uh, from the bloodstream. So it undergoes enterohepatic recirculation and it will actually remove it even further. So even though there might not be anything left in the stomach or the GI tract, it will remove it from um, this recirculation pattern that occurs. Okay, thank you very much. And can we get the mic to Dr. Kazi? Thank you, uh, Dr. Shaheen and others. Um, is uh, I know someone mentioned that uh, poisoning cases are legal cases here. Yes. Can you, is a sample required for forensic analysis to use in court? And does that uh, have to do, does that influence the decision to do the NG suction? To collect samples? That's a good question, Dr. Kazi. So each, uh, each of the poison patients has access as legal uh, patients. So we, the biochemistry lab uh, keeps the, all the urine and the serum samples. Uh, themselves uh, at least six months if there is any you know court issue about these patients. So we don't send uh, routinely to the forensic lab. Uh, exceptions if we need some specific levels of exposures, we can uh, we can send some samples to the forensic lab, but it's not our routine. So in, uh, in India, they Dr. Indira here is Dr. Indira here. Dr. Indira, yes, you are here. In India, Dr. Indira is from India actually, welcome, uh, uh, uh, she may share with you, in India they have to collect a sample. This is why every patient in India that overdoses gets an NG tube suction. They suck out the stomach, they send the stomach content for forensic analysis and use in the court to say that they overdose because sometimes they put them in prison. If they are suicide, sometimes they have to go to prison, they go to court. Dr. Indira, is that correct? Previously, it was a criminal offense. Attempted suicide was a criminal offense. So, they have to... Uh, uh, legally, uh, they are... Um, yes. So, uh, as a uh, sample, we have to take the uh, gastric flower sample for all patients. But now... Now, actually, that uh, criminal part is uh, uh, not there. Uh, attempted suicide is not a criminal offense now. Very good. Now, that's what I guess. So what is the reason then to collect the. What is the reason for the nasal gastric suction in Turkey? It's commonly done. No, it is not common. You don't. The gastric lavage. A gastric lavage. Which is. Which is not, what we do in Turkey is nasal yeah. gastric suction. We don't do gastric lavage. What is the reason for that? What can we do to change that practice? I don't think there's a, I don't think there's evidence that that practice is necessary. What do you think? Anybody knows the evidence that that is necessary? So the thing is that uh, most of the patients are coming from other disciplines, other hospitals. So they already did the nasogastric section, but in, at our institution, at Karadzins Technical University, we generally use the, if there's an indication for gastric lavage, we do all gastric lavage. In other case, we don't uh, routinely use the gastric suction. Uh, I think the thing is that we need to educate the old local physicians, especially most of them are general, general practitioners. Not every single hospital, there are no emergency medicine physicians. So it's important to inform that uh, the gastric suction is not effective methods for yeah. the, you know. And I think this is an opportunity for uh, Emad. Also, for the newly formed University Medicine Society and IPAD to come up with a position statement. You know, saying that this is not uh, the space that should not be done. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment on the um, gas provider uh, issue. Uh, I suspect part of the issue which we also need to tackle. Um, not just on the evidence side, but many of our colleague emergency physicians and junior doctors, the whole concept of that in general poison patients will be managed conservatively with good uh, 
uh, supporting management doesn't sit too well with the need to be seen doing something. Yes. And Gastric Lavage addresses that in that it's felt that you're doing something, it's dramatic, it might have some kind of dramatic effect, and then they feel we've, we've done something. And it fits in with that, that exact um, vision of a mother or parent inducing vomiting in a child. Um, and that's what, what we need to tackle that. Sitting on a patient, managing them supportively, conservatively, is not actually not doing anything. It is a form of active, supportive management. Unless we get that message across, I think we're always going to be challenged by patients presenting to non-specialists or general hospitals or community hospitals who've had to go through the trauma of attempting the fudge. So I think that's another angle that we need to add to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Very good point, Dr. In, in Turkey practice, yes, the uh, uh, NG uh, industrial lavage is especially for step hospital. It's little, maybe common, especially that Dr. Ayur said, uh, because the general practitioner uh, manages uh, this kind of those patients. But it's changing the by the time, uh, all the lavage, I think, will be more changed. Because we know that the uh, gastro uh, NG level is not uh, useful. Yeah, yeah, by the time, maybe we can prepare a statement, as you said. Short statement, yes. So, which can work. Uh, uh, Dr. Karajwe? Yes, uh, all of the, <laughs> all, I think all of the participants. I'm going to write it. <laughs> the NG uh, level is not useful. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Snow? That's our goal. Uh, gastric lavage is uh, suggested by National Poison Center. If you call the National Poison Center, they offer uh, gastric suction or gastric lavage, but you, have, uh, you can do both. But and most of the time, most of the time, they cannot reach Poison Center easily. It takes yes. minutes. You know, they already did the, the yes. contamination, and also your rights. They uh, they uh, they mentioned that please do it, the contamination and in appropriate locations. Effective or not. Um, 
the, the area that we do know it is in local anesthetic toxicity, which specifically pivocate. Everything else, it's you're in an evidence-free zone, and you're going to be writing a case report about it, and that's not enough good evidence to, su to suggest that we should be doing it. <coughs> and, and I would agree that we should be, if we have the option of ECMO, uh, that would be a preferred option over intralipid. If in a situation where you're dealing with a drug that might be might bind to intralipid therapy, and you have no other option, and the patient is about to die, you know that's the that might be an indication at that point because there's you know the there's patient flows, to do, yeah. you know so like a serious <laughs> calcium channel blocker overdose is something that we get very often in a small rural hospital in Georgia where they don't have ECMO capabilities and we can't transfer them. Right? That person, you know, might get intralipid. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? So who's that right? <laughs> I think it's my duty. <laughs> Thanks so much for your attention. Now we end the day, first day. See you tomorrow morning. Uh, thanks for uh, your participation. Thank you. Thank you guys. session. Um, I, I want to apologize for any mispronunciations that I make. Um, some of the names aren't, aren't familiar uh, to me um, when I introduce the speaker. I uh, apologize ahead of time. So first speaker is Dr. Mustafa Sabak. Um, Dr. Sabak is uh, an emergency medicine physician at um, Geisentep University. Yeah. Ah, right. I'm doing okay. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Gazi a faculty uh, in Ankara. Um, he completed his emergency medicine uh, residency in 2017 at Geisentep. Uh, he's the national director of um, advanced trauma life support training courses um, and uh, does that teaching inside and uh, also outside of Turkey. Um, he's also um, a liaison um, from Turkey to the American College of Emergency Physicians. He has many national and international published articles, book chapters, and awards. Uh, he's taken part in organizing many national and international conferences and symposiums. Um, and so today he's going to talk to us about uh, snake envenomations in, in Turkey, which is um, something I'm looking forward to hearing about. Thank you. Thank you so much for your nice words. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Mustafa Sabak. Uh, for example, <coughs> thanks for having me in here, uh, attending physician in the University Department in Gaziantep University. And I am honored to be here today to be joining this distinguished group of participants and speakers. And I'm going to be talking to you today about snake animations in Turkey. Turkey, we call it now Turkey, because formerly, sorry about that. But before we call it Turkey, now Turkey. Okay. <laughs> so I have no disclosure right now. And I came here from the Gaziantep province uh, in southeastern Turkey. Unfortunately, uh, I'm one of those who have personal experience, uh, the bitter past experience, uh, because due to the Syrian civil war, uh, unfortunately, we have we had many different cases and bad situations. And as you see, I have a little bit belly because of the food. Gaziantep is one of the best city in the gastronomy field. And we are also looking forward to see all uh, Gaziantep. Uh, hopefully, we may set up a new, different conferences in Gaziantep too. That would be honor for us. Uh, next 20 minutes or so, we are going to briefly discuss about epidemiology and identification of snake bites, worldwide and national wide, and pathophysiology of snake bite envenomations clinical presentations, different types of clinical presentation and treatment, and antivenom administration, and some researchers uh, from uh, Turkey related to snake bites. If you look at the epidemiology uh, for the uh, uh, worldwide, the snake venom is the one of the <coughs> most complex venom in national, na nature, and more than 3,000 uh, species of snake are identified worldwide. And with nearly 800 venom species uh, considered uh, venomous. 
and significant immigration occurred in both uh, tropical and uh, temperate climate and on all continents uh, except Antarctica. And available data show that nearly 5 million uh, uh, people get bitten by a snake annually. And there are some sort of the high risk groups, including rural agriculture workers, herders, and fishermen. And most of the time, as you know, uh, uh, the, the people living in poor, poorly uh, constructed houses, which is living, who are living in the village, village uh, most of the time. And uh, dry bites, uh, roughly 20% to 25%, which means venom effects do not develop. Another one is men comprise 75% of snake victims, and hopefully, fortunately, children uh, represent about 10% uh, of reported cases. And most victims are bitten on an extremity, and bites often occur uh, when an individual is purposely handling a known venomous uh, snake. Uh, there are different classification of uh, for for venomous snake bit bites, but many mainly we will classify them in four groups. Vipers is the main uh, groups uh, that we see in Turkey, in Turkey, and another ones uh, Elipidia. Sorry so about the pronunciation. And diverse group of known from fang clubri snakes, uh, formerly called clubridia. Uh, another one Antracta sividina. Sorry for the pronunciations. Latin. Uh, how about the Turkey? And uh, an average of uh, uh, 40 snake species live in our country. Of these, uh, 28 are non poisonous and 13 are uh, poisonous group. The viper family is the most common group, and there are lots of subtypes uh, uh, viper uh, amoeditas and lebetina are the most types of subtypes group. As you know, we have national poison solitary centers, and we have reports they published two weeks ago. Uh, we talk about a little bit about uh, these problems. We don't have enough the, the data uh, in detail specifically, but two number of bites that occur in Egypt is not accurate right now. But an average of uh, nearly 700 native venomous species are reported to the national center annually. Uh, there is no any data, again, mortality is rare, but if you look at the uh, researches, uh, uh, which is published from Turkey, the mortality rate is uh, very low, uh, fortunately. Um, majority of snake bites in Turkey occur between May and September, and with the peak number reported in June, men, unfortunately, again, <laughs> compromise a higher level of percentage of the snake bite victims, and Children is less percentage of snake bite victims if you compare the uh, worldwide. And most victims are bitten on an exam that is similar to the, the worldwide. And bites often occur when an individual is proposedly handling or accidentally. This is the distribution of poison group related to ages. Uh, roughly 0.06% uh, point of snake bites uh, the age group of 0 to 5 years. For distribution of all age poisoning groups, the snake spikes is roughly 0.3 or 4, which means nearly 700 cases. When you compare the uh, American Association of Poison Control Centers data, they reported it annually, but we reported is uh, reported it. Uh, between 2014 to 2000 years, huge range. Uh, I just want to emphasize this, we need to uh, report all cases to the National Poison Center to figure out uh, which cases uh, that we have in detail and how can we prevent and how we treat and outcome as well. For instance, if you look at the National Poison Center data, you couldn't be able to figure out the uh, exact type of the snakes and the patient's uh, clinical situation and the physical examination and even outcome. And if you look at the uh, annual reports of uh, American Association of Poison Control Centers data, you may find uh, different cases even. For instance, snake bites due to the uh, unflactive reaction due to the snake bites or stroke due to the snake bites, etc. for instance.
but unfortunately we don't have. So we, we, we need to change this by your help, not uh, just only for the national data. We need to add uh, very important information uh, to our data too. And if you look at the region, and same was is more common in warm uh, regions such as the Mediterranean and Southeastern that we live. Uh, more common the viper, as I told you before, and less common area is in the north side of Turkey. The viper family is the most common group, as I told you before, and this is the subtypes that we commonly see, and they have a hemotoxic venom, nearly uh, 700 cases every year for viper snake by information. That's probably underreported again. If you look at the pathophysiology of venomous, there are different types of the snakes. But venomous snakes poses glands that are associated with the specialized teeth or fangs, which allow the delivery of uh, venom uh, for purpose of prayer, <coughs> immobilization, and defense. The fangs are located in the front of the uh, mouth in most uh, venomous species. In addition to fang, venomous snakes have rows of uh, small teeth that may cause additional injury due to a bite. And there is a contraction muscle, and this muscle propels to venom into the fangs and eventually into bitten tissue through openings near the tips. It is difficult to attribute specific pathology to any particular component of snake venom. In fact, the clinical effects often occur as a result of severe venom components such as cytotoxic hemorrhage and neurotoxic effects. More than 100 distinct enzymes have been identified, but they are broadly classified into three main groups, as I told you. <coughs> and they have large and diamond head shape and with elliptical pupils like the cat like, cat eyes like. Pits located between nostril and uh, eyes, it is uh, heat sensing organs. There are side effects, there are some different types of proteinases, uh, metalloproteinase, phospholipase A2, which both contribute to swelling and through distribution of the extracellular matrix and uh, basement membrane surrounding microscopic epithelial cells. As a result of reduce, uh, the reduced blood flow through the damaged tissue, uh, uh, they are also uh, contribute to non-minor bruises, which result primarily from the action of phospholipase A2 enzymes or muscle, and the, as a result of these effects, we see the clinical reflection of, uh, such as pain, with muscle sweating, and redness. Venom effects on the hemorrhagic system are especially complex. Numerous components uh, act as anticoagulant, and many others act as procoagulant. Platelets are inhibited, activated, aggregated by the various common uh, components. Hematological effects may include bleeding at the puncture site, as you see in here, and um, uh, local uh, bleeding uh, causing hemorrhagic blaps, uh, hyperfibrinogenia, and coagulopathy resulting in elevated INR, INR and uh, most usually the thrombocytopenia. DIC, fortunately, is rare, but if it's occurred, its mortality rate is very high. But the vast majority of Patients in here have no clinical uh, bleeding, even when you have a severe uh, abnormal laboratory pathology. There are toxic uh, uh, effects that we don't have, fortunately, in here. Uh, Snake neurotoxin at, uh, at the neuromuscular junction and do not cross the blood brain barrier. Mohavitoxin, they call it, that acts at the presynaptic terminal uh, at, of the neuromuscular junction to inhibit acetylcholine release and causing a respiratory or skeletal muscle or fasciculation like this one. I took this one from the YouTube. We don't have any types of clinical presentation, but you, if, you, if any patient present with the, any types of animal bites and at the same time this type of clinical presentation, you need to be concerned about the same uh, bites. <clears throat> so, how can make a diagnosis and, uh, and, and uh, let's talk about the clinical presentation again. There are two types of uh, bites. Dry bites, uh, the venom effects do not develop. Another one is venomous bites. As you see in here, there are two uh, fang marks. This is the dry bites, but, but 
it's a tough issue to discharge early uh, real total data. And the uh, venous part, you see the uh, hemorrhagic blebs and ecchymosis and edema if you compare the other fingers. So different two types of semantic information. How about the identification? It's very common in here. Uh, most of the people who bite by snakes, they try to identify the same types. It is not beneficial, but it's at, at the same time unnecessary uh, because the treatment is based on, based on uh, clinical symptoms and not the specific uh, uh, snake evolved. So if you're concerned about envenomation, you need to figure out the snake bite and at the same time, soft tissue in order to figure out the exact uh, uh, <coughs> types. Another uh, important population are children. Children may not be able to communicate with you and especially vulnerable of snake bite in, uh, in one week and often become disabled and die. For the clinical presentation, some patients present with the local uh, symptoms, some patients are uh, present with the uh, systemic or both. <coughs> For the local pain, swelling, redness, and edema, in general, local swelling at the bite side becomes apparent within 15 to 30 minutes, but in some cases, swelling may not start for several hours. And for the progression of the uh, inflammation, you will see philosophic hemosis. For the systemic uh, symptoms, start with the mild, moderate, and severe. For the mild, patient most of the time present with the nausea, vomiting, and metallic taste. If the condition is getting worse, may present with hypertension and cardiac depression or anaphylactic rational coagulopathy such as bleeding everywhere, even eyes. Uh, but as I told you before, we, I don't have, have I haven't, uh, uh, I never have uh, any cases related to neurotoxin and neurologic symptoms related to the snake bites. My patient may present with phosphorylation, uh, as you saw. Those are different uh, uh, level of uh, snake bites. First of all, there's only local edema, a little bit chemosis, and we mark the uh, location to, to figure out the, or follow up the patient's progression. Another one is ecchymosis and edema if you compare the other fingers, another one bullos and a little bit uh, bleeding from the puncture side, another one neurologic symptoms. So it depends on the snake's subtypes. For the uh, laboratory test, based, uh, based on labs including CBC, uh, compre uh, comprehensive metabolic plana, INI, fibrinogen, and uh, D-dimer, which is more specific than the other laboratory result, we need to, should, you, should, you should obtain it, obtain them. For the treatment, uh, pre-hospital management should be focused on safe, uh, and safe transport to the uh, healthcare facility, which is important. Any items that may cause construction as the limb swells, such as rings, which you, you should remove all of them. Uh, several treatments before the EMS arrives have been shown to be ineffective and may potentially be harmful to the patient. This instrument, like uh, try to kill or decapitate the snakes and cutting the skin, or these types of equipment, we don't use it. But this is commercial one, it's suction the uh, human machine, uh, uh, venom, and another one tourniquet. <sighs> Sorry about that, but this video is very good. I'm gonna show a section from the old Turkish movie, The Actor was Junaid Arkin, uh, who was very popular in Turkey and was also a doctor. Unfortunately, we know that all the applications you see in this video are made by public. Therefore, public education is more important steps to achieve a better outcome.
He did every wrong thing, yeah, squeezing, suction, turning it. So we need to avoid all of them as a public, not as a lecturer. So that's why I leave, it, uh, leave this in a column first, first of all. The effect externally should be immobilized uh, with a loose plinth like this one and elevated at above the heart to minimize uh, the pen edema. The lower extremity can also be placed on the pillow. For the pain management, if you administer the antivenom, the pain is getting better. But if, you, if the patient needs any uh, painkillers, should be treated with uh, opioids, non serial or other drugs. Should be avoided due to the potential increase of the bleeding. And TTRN's prophylaxis should be updated. For the antibiotics, most of the time, for the general practitioners, use antibiotics for the same inflammation, but should not be given only for the prophylactic reason. If there is any neuropathic tissue or you're concerned about the soft tissue infection, you should study it early. Uh, I would like to mention a little bit about the uh, antivenom. Uh, EIG molecule consists of the FC and the FAP molecule chains have reliable regulation which allows uh, to divide certain uh, venoms in this location. When, e, uh, when the EGG is treated by pepsin, like this, uh, the EGG molecule is cleared below the hinge and, uh, and, and FAP2 fragment is produced. When the EGG is treated with popain, the cleavage appears above the hinge and two fat fragments is produced. Why I needed to mention about this one? Because the FC fragment is more immunogenic. For the oldest one, oldest antivenoms, including like this one. For, for this reason, these antivenoms were, were very immunogenic and can cause an anaphylactic reaction. But new, uh, new uh, provocation techniques produce this one, so it is less immunogenic. That's why we are using this one. Okay? Antivenom should be uh, considered for any patient with progressive local symptoms or any signs of systemic symptoms, such as hematology or neurogenic. Uh, so we have two types of antivenom. The first one is polycella. It, produce, uh, start, uh, it is uh, produced uh, in 2014 to be used in treatment of the snake bites. Another one uh, is distributed by the public health uh, the, the directorate and started to be produced in 2019. Both antivenom contain uh, globulins against the uh, common subtypes, uh, which are commonly seen in our country. And there is no dosing adjustment for pediatric patients because the amount of venom that requires neutralization is not uh, weight dependent. And the same thing for the pregnant patients. You need to use it for the pregnant patients, but this is the category C. So you need to balance the advantages and disadvantages. And by the way, this, the, the, those are the horse derived antitoxin group with FAP2. And this is our traditional snake by CBT grading scale, where if a patient uh, has a mind minimal a local swelling or edema, we always start with the two or four vials. Uh, uh, if it's more severe, we are increasing doses uh, due to this uh, grading scale. Fascia tomy uh, compartment syndrome has been documented, but it is very rare. It is rare. Clinically, it can be difficult to differentiate between compartment syndrome and the, a severe local inflammation. Uh, if suspected, direct compartment pressure uh, should be measured because you may confuse the this is related to severe inflammation or related to compartment syndrome because both sides clinical capacity is similar, are similar, like pain, uh, uh, pallor, and uh, uh, color, uh, it's, it both sides are cold, so you may confuse it. If you're concerned about compartment syndrome, uh, no need to be urgent, uh, give some antivenom again, do not, uh, obtain fasciotomy, you may consult the surgeon to obtain uh, fasciotomy, but antivenom is over the fasciotomy. How about the blood products? Uh, blood products including platelet and FFP are not indicated as they will not reverse the effect of the venom because the venom is into the bloodstream. So when you give any types of blood, like platelet or, CB, uh, like, or red blood cells, they have, uh, can cause hemolysis. So give some uh, 
uh, antivenom again. Uh, if uh, there are any signs of severe bleeding and blood loss of concern is a concern, then blood pro pro products may be considered. How about the observation? And and when the patient can't uh, take up to 12 uh, hours to show signs and symptoms, <coughs> there, there are, th therefore, patients should be closely monitored for local and systemic symptoms. But most of the time, we need to close up at least eight hours. Lastly, uh, I would like to mention about our researches. This is from the, the PubMed. Last 10 years, we published 23 uh, publications related to snake bites. Which is a good number, but for the other laboratory, there are 300 publications uh, for the last year, 10 years. This is our thesis centers for the uh, our guests. I would like to, I, I want to mention about our system for the residency program. If you want to graduate the residency program, you should finish any thesis topic. In our uh, hospital uh, emergency department, uh, we are giving a topic uh, after two years uh, to the residents and after two years they start to clinical or expensive studies, it doesn't matter. They have to finish their thesis topic, otherwise couldn't be able to graduate it. I think about that, that we have only nine thesis topics related to snake bites. It's a very common issue. I'm going to give some uh, research examples. Gulen et al. Uh, she's, a, uh, she's a PhD student with me in our emergency department, <clears throat> at the same time in emergency stuff. In this study, two types of antivenom were compared, and it was observed that the antivenom obtained from the Ministry of Health was given <coughs> veils on average and symptoms such as allergic and fever develop. She compared both sides. Are you trying at all? In this study, it was emphasized that general practitioner use of level VLs is high and therefore the management of antivenom should be updated. Thanks for this study because general practitioners always um, afraid of the you know level issue. Uh, so they, are, they, they don't have enough experience on the, how to use antivenom and its complications. So start for the uh, antivenom. Even it's for the uh, scorpion bites, the scorpion inflammations too. They are always using antivenom for them. So this is a good stu study, thank you. And this study in which I was included, patient prison with the study 70 snake bites were related. There was no mortality among these patients. And one of the patient conditions were progressed and the patient was treated with plasmapheresis and antivenom with a good uh, outcome. So this is another important study. Uh, if you look at the textbook uh, on the, the snake bites, there, are, there is no any information about the plasma fibrosis. But in our clinic, and uh, this, this study was carried out in our clinic, where I work, a snake bite plasma fibrosis was performed on 37 patients over a nine year period. All patients were discharged in a good calm. But these patients were very sick and, uh, and, and resistant to the support and antivenom treatment. So we, don't, we didn't have any uh, opportunity to save the patient's life or ex uh, extremity. Uh, so this is the other option. Uh, if, you, uh, if you focus on the lecture yesterday, uh, Dr. Uh, mentioned about uh, our uh, literature is based on the case reported and experiences. So that's why we may keep in mind this one. This is not 100%. But randomized controlled trial with high level of, uh, uh, based on uh, the literature. I'm sorry about that. The, this is, this is uh, another uh, treatment option for the resistant therapy. And another one, uh, article on the use of plasma pheresis is emphasized that it is a good alternative method in resistant snake bites inflammation, and even they don't have, they didn't have any immortality rate uh, due to the plasma pheresis too. Take on point. Five species, species uh, which is at the forefront at hematology toxicity is seen more frequently and mortality rate is very low. The National Poison Solitary Center needs to keep the data in more detail, in my opinion. And each case should be reported by the physician. This is our responsibility to the National Poison Solitary Center in order to create a reliable data 
and more qualified research is needed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Uh, we will we'll save uh, questions and comments until the end of the session. Um, so we have our next speakers get started. Thank you. Okay, good morning. My name is Jumai Yadram from Gaziantep University. I am a professor in the And in addition, uh, I am a head of the department in clinical toxicology in our uh, university. Uh, this uh, speaker from Tokuzeli uh, University in Arja. But first of all, I want to give me give you some short information about our speaker. Uh, Ayn Arja uh, is graduated from Aga University, Faculty of Medicine, 1998. She completed her PhD in Medical Pharmacology in Tokuzeli University, Faculty of Medicine, uh, in 2007. She is still working in the same university, she has studies on cardiac toxicity and hepatotoxicity and also has studies in the field of clinical pharmacology. She has 30 articles uh, published uh, in international journals and 12 articles published in national journals. Uh, today, uh, Ms. Irene Arja uh, shared with us uh, about assessment and management in poisons, mushrooms in Anatolia. Yes, we are speaking. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> First of all, I want to thank the organizing committee to their invitation to this uh, beautiful conference. Uh, in uh, this time, I'm going to talk about assessment and management of poisonous mushrooms in Anatolia. According to my presentation plan, uh, incidence of mushroom poisonings, types of mushroom poisonings, diagnosis, treatment and prognosis are the main uh, topics of this talk. And uh, in the epidemiology, about 100 of the 10,000 uh, <coughs> mushroom species found in the nature uh, cause toxicity in the world, right? And uh, it is uh, well known that collecting and eating mushrooms from nature to be a delicious taste, especially in uh, rainy uh, spring months. Uh, but it is difficult to separate uh, edible and uh, toxic ones, and uh, the uh, poisoning is uh, often occur with these white type uh, mushroom ingestions. And uh, it is not possible to know the exact rate of mushroom poisoning because there are many unreported cases, but the frequency of mushroom poisoning in Turkey is uh, between 1.2 and 1.8 percent among all poisonings according to National Poison Center data and nearly uh, 1,000 toxic mushroom poisonings reported annually. And if you look to uh, mushroom uh, in Turkey, uh, Turkey is a very rich uh, mushroom university because uh, the uh, climate and vegetation, uh, uh, all types of mushroom poisonings uh, may be observed, but especially corpus species, amanita phyllides, amanita pantherina, and mushrooms that cause simple gastrointestinal uh, symptoms are uh, common. But the amanita phyllides type, cyclopeptid containing mushrooms, uh, cause serious symptoms in emergency department, and uh, they are responsible <coughs> of uh, nearly 95% uh, of fatal mushroom poisonings. Uh, mushroom poisonings are classified into two, uh, three groups according to one set of clinical findings. Uh, these are acute onset toxicity syndrome, uh, late onset toxicity, and delayed onset toxicity. In these groups, uh, there are 14 uh, mushroom related toxidromes described. And in the first group, acute onset uh, toxicity group, the clinical symptoms uh, start. Uh, within six hours after mushroom ingestion, and there are six syndromes in uh, this group. And the uh, first syndrome is cholinergic syndrome, and uh, the mushrooms cause cholinergic syn syndrome are inocibe and clitocibe type mushrooms. They include muscarine and muscarine binds muscarine receptors and uh, cause uh, this uh, classical cholinergic findings such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, hypersalivation, EMDs, blurred vision, and clinical symptoms start within two hours, and treatments include some positive treatment, and also atropine uh, is used until the uh, respiratory secretions drying, and also antibiotics <coughs> may be used. In the second syndrome, is uh, glutamergic and glutamergic 
syndrome. Uh, Amenta uh, muscaria and Amenta pantena species mushrooms cause uh, glutamine tanga barrage syndrome, and this syndrome is also called uh, pantelia and muscaria syndrome. Uh, their toxins are the botanic acids and muscimol, and chemical findings depends on the mushrooms <laughs> ingredients. And if the botanic acid ingredient is high, uh, Myoclinic moments and seizures are prominent, and if the musimol content is high, the somnolence uh, dizziness hallucinations is more prominent. And the clinical finding starts within two hours, and treatment includes uh, supportive treatment. Also, uh, if there is a seizures, uh, benzodiazepines may be used. Uh, in the <coughs> third group, mushroom toxicity in acute toxicity. Uh, group, epileptic uh, syndrome. Uh, Geometrial type mushrooms cause epileptic seizures. They include geometrin. Geometrin decreases GABA and causes seizures. And uh, in this type of mushroom poisonings, uh, firstly, there may be gastrointestinal symptoms and clinical findings start within five hours. In the treatment, pyridoxine is used because uh, Geromitrin inhibits pyridoxal uh, phosphate related enzymatic pathways, and if the seizures doesn't give response to uh, pyridoxine, uh, benzodiazepines may be used. And the uh, other syndrome, hallucinogenic syndrome, psilocybe type uh, mushrooms cause uh, hallucinations, they include psilocybin and uh, uh, psilocybin actuates presynaptic serotonin 2A receptors. It, but at high doses, it inhibits uh, muscarinic receptors, <coughs> and uh, they have also uh, anticholinergic effects in high doses. Clinical findings start within one hour, and uh, hallucinations or delusions are prominent uh, because uh, these effects, uh, these uh, mushroom uh, types, uh, has abuse potential, uh, and the uh, clinical effects are both related. And of course, in high doses, agitation, anxiety, nervousness, confusion, tachycardia, and other clinical findings may be prominent. And the treatment includes benzodiazepines and, and uh, supportive <coughs> treatment. The uh, other syndrome is the sulfur like reaction, and uh, corpinus type mushrooms cause uh, this uh, sulfur like reaction when taken together with alcohol or within uh, three days. They include coprin and coprin metabolite inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase and uh, causes acetaldehyde accumulation. Uh, and uh, the uh, classical <coughs> like reaction findings occur is the arch the flushing, headache, dizziness, and hypotension. Clinical findings starts within two hours. Treatment uh, includes <coughs> antibiotic treatments uh, and all, uh, antibiotics or antihistamines may be used. <coughs> The other uh, and last syndrome in acute onset toxicity group, acute gastroenteritis, and many of the mushrooms uh, are, have uh, this uh, effect, and uh, chlorophyllium, entoloma, lactorius, onfalotus, and tricoloma type mushrooms cause acute gastroenteritis. Uh, their toxin aren't identified, uh, but the toxic effect mechanism may be related to allergy or malabsorption. Clinical findings start within three hours three hours with the classical gastrointestinal and treat findings, abdominal pain, cramps, nausea, vomiting, watery or damp, uh, blue di di diarrhea, and treatment <coughs> includes antiemetics and also fluid resuscitation. The second group is late onset mushroom toxicity group, and uh, there are three, uh, three uh, mushroom-related syndromes uh, in this group. And uh, the clinical uh, finding starts uh, after uh, between uh, 6 and 24 uh, hours uh, after mushroom ingestion. And uh, uh, among this group, uh, hepatotoxic syndrome is the most important one because, uh, as I said before, uh, mushroom-related deaths uh, are uh, in big proportion related with hepatotoxicity. And Amanita uh, species uh, mushrooms cause uh, hepatotoxicity. Uh, they have three toxins, amatoxins, 
fazla toksins, ermayo toksins, alt toksins, ardı e, primary toksins, that cause hepatotoksi. E, their absorption from gastrointestinal system is well. E, they enter the e, system circulation e, very rapidly. Then e, enters the enterocardial circulation and e, reach the target tissue liver by e, binding organic ionic transporter peptide, e, peptide 1B3, then e, inhibits RNA polymerase 2 and e, degrades protein synthesis and causes liver necrosis. And e, also uh, the uh, toxin is excreted from uh, kidneys in the urine. But the alpha mentin has another toxic effect mechanism. Uh, and uh, the other toxic effect mechanism are contribute its toxicity. Uh, these are inflammation, oxidative stress development, and uh, induction of apoptosis. Uh, the clinical findings in this type of uh, mushrooms uh, start after an asymptomatic period. It depends. Uh, it, it may be six or twenty-four hours. It depends uh, according to uh, amount of mushroom ingested. But in the first stage, uh, after 6 or 24 hours, uh, the uh, first clinical findings are watery or blue diarrhea, colic-like abdominal pain and vomiting. And if it is not suspected in this in this stage, the uh, toxicity uh, confused with uh, viral gastroenterites. In the second stage, one or two days, the clinical findings uh, of gastrointestinal uh, symptoms of result but uh, biochemical and chemical signs of liver toxicity become evident and in the third stage liver and kidney failure develop also uh, this uh, type of uh, mushrooms may be fatal uh, and the treatment includes supportive treatment and uh, because toxin has an enterocardial circulation repetitive those activated charcoal is beneficial, uh, especially within three days, and penicillin, acetylidine, and acetylstein are used as an antidote, but their effectiveness uh, aren't proven in uh, clinical uh, studies. But uh, there are some experimental uh, studies uh, for uh, worse the toxic effects of uh, amethyloides and uh, in future maybe resveratrol may promise it because in in vitro and in, in vivo studies uh, it is shown that uh, beneficial uh, in in the uh, late times and the uh, treatment also uh, include uh, enhanced elimination, activated charcoal hemoperfusion and uh, molecular absorption recirculating system may be used <coughs> and uh, in, uh, if it is needed, uh, liver transplantation uh, may be performed. And the other uh, late time uh, toxicity syndrome is nephrotoxic syndrome. The other uh, amanita species causes uh, this syndrome, uh, amanita proxima amanita simitiana. Uh, they include norlecin and chloretrilisin. Their toxic effect mechanism aren't identified, but clinical findings starts within uh, 12 hours. And uh, there are mild clinical findings, gastrointestinal symptoms, reversible renal failure, and uh, mild liver damage may be uh, possible. Uh, and the, the treatment includes uh, supportive treatment, also uh, hemodialysis uh, used for renal failure. And the uh, third syndrome is erythromelagia. And creatocyte type <coughs> mushrooms cause erythromelagia. Uh, these type of mushrooms are uh, located in uh, Japan, but in uh, Turkey, paralipsis, omelansis uh, described recently, uh, and uh, there it may have uh, similar findings. And uh, the uh, mushrooms that cause erythromelagia uh, uh, causes clinical symptoms within one day, and renal swelling and burning pain in the extremities are prominent, and uh, treatment includes nicotinic acid. And in the third group of mushroom toxicity, the late onset mushroom toxicity, and in this group, uh, nephrotoxic, rhabdomyotic, and neurotoxic uh, mushrooms are. Uh, and uh, the uh, nephrotoxic mushrooms uh, give 
uh, findings in late time are orelinin and cortinary species, and their toxins are orelinin and <coughs> cortinarin A, B, and C, and uh, their uh, toxic effect mechanism is related to oxidative stress development and uh, decreasing antioxidant defense systems and clinical findings starts days and after of mushroom ingestion and uh, therefore uh, to know this is uh, difficult and the, uh, there isn't uh, first clinical symptoms like gastrointestinal systems and after days and weeks uh, the renal failure findings is prominent, uh, polydips olivary and in the laboratory hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, hypocalcemia and uh, hyperphosphatemia and treatment includes semidual disease, peritoneal disease, exocorporal hemoperfusion, plasmophoresis and kidney transplantation. And the other group is rhabdomyolytic uh, mushrooms, Trichuloma equestra and Lustula subnigrans uh, are among these mushrooms and they induce mute music disease and uh, the uh, rhabdomyolysis findings occur and uh, in the laboratory pigmented urine plus in the urine red or brown color of the urine spinatum and marked elevation of creatinine plus uh, are prominent and the treatment include uh, fluid replication, urine output monitoring and management of hyperkalemia. And the uh, last syndrome in this group is neurotoxic syndrome, but uh, little is known about this uh, syndrome. And uh, after overview of uh, these uh, mushroom-related uh, uh, syndromes, how is the diagnosis? Uh, the first, the, of course, identification of the ingested mushroom is very important, but uh, generally it is uh, very uh, difficult to separate uh, uh, toxic, and, uh, toxic mushroom and to evaluate the mushroom by a mycologist. Uh, therefore, uh, diagnosis based on clinical findings. And the time interval between mushroom ingestion and the onset of clinical symptoms is very important. And uh, the hospital admission criteria of mushroom poisonings are uh, patients with delay symptoms more than six hours, Patients with early symptoms less than three hours after mushroom ingestion who remain symptomatic beyond six hours despite supportive treatment. And patients with evidence of rhabdomyolysis, liver toxicity, or renal insufficiency, or asymptomatic patients in whom ingestion of amatoxin containing mushroom uh, suspected. And uh, there isn't a specific test to measure the uh, toxins in the blood or urine and uh, because the, the most uh, fatal mushrooms are hepatotoxic and nephrotoxic uh, ones and uh, therefore the evaluation of liver function test and uh, renal function test and follow-up uh, is very important uh, in the uh, diagnosis of mushroom poisoning. In the treatment, uh, in the acute transit uh, mushroom toxicity syndromes, uh, there are two <coughs> syndromes in this group, and uh, treatment uh, includes fluid rehabilitation, symptomatic treatment, and benzodiazepines. And uh, uh, if the clinical findings start in late or the late period, uh, the, uh, if the patient admitted to the hospital uh, after six hours with no vomiting, and uh, it may be uh, amyntophyloides, and uh, in this uh, time, time activated char uh, charcoal and repetitive dose activated charcoal uh, may, must be performed. And after in the uh, emergency department, uh, <coughs> liver function test and renal function test uh, must be uh, evaluated, and they must uh, they must follow up. Uh, and uh, amyntophyloides uh, type uh, mushroom. Poisoning, uh, the liver function test is high at 48 hours and at this time uh, repetitive dose that very cheaper antidotes such as penicillin, gas, libidin, and acetacid are used and activated charcoal hemoperfusion marks are used and liver, liver transplantation may be needed and also intensive care management is important. And uh, the 48 hour of the liver function test are normal and patient stable. Uh, the uh, patient can be discharged from the hospital, but if there is some 
uh, renal failure findings in this case, uh, it may need uh, hemodialysis, and hemodialysis in the cases in nephrotoxic mushrooms are fluid overload that is refractory to diuretics, hyperkalemi <coughs> or repeat dry serum potassium, escalopri and rapt analysis, metabolic acidosis, and signs of uremia. And if we look to prognosis, uh, most mushroom poisoning that cause gastrointestinal symptoms and uh, acute onset mushroom toxicity improve with adequate supportive treatment and hepatotic, uh, hepatotoxic mushrooms <coughs> containing cyclopeptide are large responsible <coughs> for deaths due to mushroom poisonings. Therefore, we can say a good in case of early onset symptoms and poor in case of uh, late uh, onset of uh, symptoms. And uh, as a conclusion, uh, some uh, mushroom species can be associated with serious mortality and mortality because there is no specific laboratory evaluation to uh, detect the toxin in uh, urine or blood. Basic laboratory evaluation of liver uh, transurbinases and renal function test is very important. And uh, in the management of mushroom poisonings, fluid really support, uh, symptomatic supportive treatment approach are very important. Uh, there are no problem antidotes in the treatment and a specific treatment approach should be applied according to mushroom species. And uh, I want to thank you. Okay, I want to thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, actually, uh, first of all, I want to invite all speakers in here. Uh, then, uh, the next speaker, after completing all the presentation, I want to uh, give you uh, all questions. So, uh, the next speaker uh, from Marmara University, uh, Sinan Karajabey. Uh, Sinan Karajabey is going to present with us uh, assessment and management of poisons and in Anatolia. But first of all, I want to give you some short information about uh, Karajabai. Uh, he was born in 1984 in Bursa. He completed his primary, middle and high school education in Bursa. Then he graduated from Udada University in 2008 uh, and in 2013. He received his emergency medicine specialization from Kartal, uh, Dr. Lutfi Kartal Training and Research Hospital. Uh, then, in 2017, he started to work as an assistant professor in Marmara University. He received the title of associate professor in 2019, and he is still working in uh, an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Marmara University. At the same time, he continues his doctorate education at the Edithepe University Faculty of Pharmacy, Department of Pharmaceutical Toxicology. He was ongoing studies and publications on imaging methods in emergency department, toxicology analysis methods, genotoxicity, and cardiogenesis. Is it true? Okay, yes. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, my dear colleagues, uh, I want to thank the organization committee uh, for inviting me to this valued uh, and prosperous conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about in this session assessment and management of poisonous plants in Anatolia. Uh, when we look at epidemiology all around the world, herbal supplement market in 2015 $93 billion per year, and when we came to 2017 uh, $107 billion per year. Four out, of, uh, four out of 10 adults and one out of 10 children uh, used herbal supplements once in a lifetime. Mostly used for nutrition, non vitamin, and non mineral compounds. In Turkey, it's an expanding, uh, growing market cap in 2017, uh, $3 billion per year growth. When we look at National Poison Center's data, uh, plants caused 0.85% uh, of all intoxications. Uh, yesterday, uh, Kairos Technical University's data uh, shared with us uh, in that uh, presentation. 8 or 10 percent of all intoxications caused by plants, and this shows us the uh, importance of regional uh, data of intoxications. Uh, but plants do not cause uh, toxicity just by themselves. Human health products also produce from uh, herb extracts, and 65.5 percent of all intoxications caused by human health products. 
uh, but we do not know the exact ratio of uh, plants in these products. Herbal products uh, mostly used for treatment of a disease, uh, losing weight or cosmetic reasons. Uh, also, they can use by extensively and really for suicidal purposes and abuse. I will try to summarize uh, the toxic plants in uh, some main topics because there are lots of uh, toxic plants in Anatolia. Uh, the mechanism of actions and <coughs> of, the, uh, of these toxicities. We will talk about anticholinergic plants, cardiacerics, convulsive effect plants, plants containing cyanogenic compounds, nicotine like alkaloids, sodium channel activators, and toxalogen. Our first group is anticholinergic plants. They mostly grow in the Mediterranean region of Anatolia. Dimson wheat, Atropobia gadoma, and Angel's trumpet is the most seen anticholinergic plants in Anatolia. In 2019, uh, news uh, spread that an outbreak in Istanbul uh, of Spanish related poisoning. Uh, in the first line, we all thought that this was caused by pesticides, uh, but the symptoms of these patients uh, were anticholinergic uh, symptoms. Uh, and the trivial Atropona belladona uh, leaf mixed with spinach and caused the anticholinergic toxicity. Also, Angus Trumpet, uh, which took as pumpkin flower to uh, make, uh, especially in Mediterranean region, to make, uh, uh, to cook stuff, and this was caused poisoning. When we look at the mechanism of action, uh, Atropona scopolamine binds to the receptor and acetylcholine cannot bind to its receptor and uh, the lack of acetylcholine caused anticholinergic toxicity. Uh, yesterday we talked about toxin drums, it says a good number of mnemonic. Uh, hot as a desert, mad as a hatter, blind as a bat, red as a beet, dry as a bone. Also we can uh, observe that fairly an absent vowel sounds in these patients. The treatment is supportive and symptomatic treatment, but uh, luckily we have an antidote for uh, this uh, toxicity. Phytostigmine can be used as a treatment. Our other group is cardiac steroids or cardiac glucosides. Uh, Oregano in the Aegean region, Lily of the Valley in the Mediterranean region, and Oleander uh, in the mostly grow in the Mediterranean region and marketed as a can cure of cancer uh, in uh, Anatolia. Unlikely. The mechanism of action is uh, the similar as digital. Uh, they block the sodium potassium ATPS channel, and uh, this leads to uh, sodium calcium exchange works in a, uh, improperly, and intracellular calcium increases. This leads to uh, increasing in entropy. In the toxicity, excessive amount of intracellular calcium causes cardiac dysrhythmias. The pathognomic ECG finding is downsloping ST segment depression with U waves, called Dali's mustache. We can use the Goxian immune antibodies in this toxicity, uh, addition to supportive and uh, symptomatic treatment. There are lots of common effect plants all around Anatolia. Water hemlock and heartbeat in the eastern Anatolia, travel show in the southeastern Anatolia. A golden chain in the west uh, part of the Black Sea region, hemlock in the Marmara region, tree tobacco and lanthanum in the Aegean region, uh, wind flower in the Mediterranean region, and at last sophora grows in the Anatol uh, central Anatolia region. There are lots of common effect plants because they have a wide variety of acting mechanisms: gamma antagonism, imbalance in acetylcholine homeostasis, acting on sodium channels. Uh, creating hypoglycemia and antagonizing the inhibitory effect of glycine on the postnatic motor neuron, uh, the effect of citrulline, hopefully uh, citrulline does not grow in uh, Anatolia naturally. In the treatment, we will first uh, exclude or treat the hypoxia and uh, hypoglycemia. Seizures, seizures can be controlled by benzodiazepines. Diazepam or lorazepam can be chosen. Barbitrap and propofol uh, can also be chosen as a treatment. Phenytoin, as we all know, is contraindicated in acute poisoning, but in the uh, treatment of uh, these uh, plants uh, in the literature is controversial. Plants containing cyanogenic compounds, blackberry, uh, mostly grow in the Black Sea region, Malpola in the South Asian and West part of the Mediterranean region, Hydrangea in the Mediterranean region, Wild Apple in the Southeastern Anatolia, and apricot in the eastern Anatolia. 
This plan is contained amygdala and transport, transforms into cyanide uh, after its metabolism. Uh, the excessive consumption of these seeds uh, causes cyanide toxicity. <coughs> Uh, cyanide can be eliminated directly by urine, lung, and sweat. And also, transfiltration reaction uh, produces thiocyanide, and that will be excreted with urine, the other detoxification pathway. If these detoxification pathways are insufficient, uh, cyanide binds to cytochrome C oxidase enzyme and blocks the Krebs cycle. Uh, that causes anaerobic glycolysis, and we call it as isotoxic hypoxia. In the treatment, uh, we can use methylmoglobin forming agents to produce uh, cyanometalloglobin, that's a, a stable, non-toxic compound. Uh, we use the uh, sodium nitrate for the treatment uh, for this. And we can also use hydroxycobalamin to produce cyanocobalamin that will be directly eliminated by urea. Plantomotanic mitotic inhibitors are uh, Vinca in the uh, Aegean region and the Wolseir in the Eastern Anatolia region. These mitotic inhibitors uh, interact with the polymerization of microtubules and uh, arrest the cell division at the metaphase stage. Uh, the cell remains many hours at this stage and leads to that. Vomiting, diarrhea, oral ulcer, and gastrointestinal reproduce occurs. At early stage, we can observe leukocytosis, but at the late stage of the intoxication, leukopenia develops. Attacks and peripheral neuropathy also can be seen. And at the late stage of the intoxication, multi organ failure and uh, sepsis uh, develops due to direct cellular toxicity leads to death. Treatment is symptomatic and supportive treatment, but uh, patients with bone marrow toxicity, we can consider colon stimulating factors uh, for treatment. And uh, for these patients, early hematology consultation is necessary. Uh, plants containing nicotine like alkaloids are the subset of uh, convulsive effect plants, golden chain, hamlo, uh, tree tobacco, and sophora is the nicotine like alkaloids grows in Anatolia. When we look at the mechanism of action, uh, acetylcholine binds to the uh, acetylcholine receptor uh, and causes the uh, cation influx, sodium, calcium, and potassium in the intracellular area and rapidly metabolizing the choline and acetic acid, and the channel closes. This is the normal physiology. <laughs> but in nicotine poisoning, uh, nicotine competitively binds to the uh, acetylcholine receptor and persistently opens the channel and will not metabolize or lay the receptor, and uh, this causes persistent influx of sodium, calcium, potassium, and cal uh, that leads to depolarization of the neurons. There are lots of uh, nicotinic receptors, as we all know, in the system. And receptors cause sympathetic stimulation and parasympathetic stimulation that uh, cause hypertension, tachycardia, diaphoresis, salivation, and vomiting. And receptors cause hyperstimulation. Fasciculation and muscle weakness can be observed. Rarely we can observe the polarizing neuromuscular blockage. If the nicotinic receptors, cerebral nicotinic receptors, are affected, seizures occur in these patients. When we look at the sodium channel activators, uh, rhododendron in the Black Sea region, and it's an important intoxication in this uh, region. Uh, we mentioned yesterday methane poisoning. This is the uh, plant reason. Uh, this is the main reason of the methane poisoning. And mountain daphne in the uh, Mediterranean region, and aconite in the eastern Anatolia region. Clinic is sodium channel activates increase the excitability of voltage dependent sodium channels and vomiting, paresthesia, facilitation, motor weakness, and paralysis occur. Continuous sodium attack uh, causes persistent depolarization and repolarization is inhibited. Seizures and dysrhythmias can be observed. Sodium attack also increases the calcium exchange and intracellular myocardial uh, calcium increases that leads to increasing inotropy and dysrhythmias. Sinus bradycardia, AD blocks, repolarization abnormalities, and ventricular dyspnea can be older, as like the cardiac glucoside poisoning. Uh, hypertension can be treated with sudden infusion, but if uh, sudden is uh, insufficient, inotropic agents can be used. Uh, Norepinephrine is the first choice uh, in the treatment. Sinus bradycardia and conduction blocks uh, can be treated with atropine. Uh, if ventricular dyspnea occurs, lidocaine and amiodarone uh, to block the sodium channel can be used. Uh, I mentioned that they are similar to cardiac glucoside, but molecular structure of the toxin is not similar, so uh, for that reason, digoxin specific antibodies is useless in this toxicity. 
Our last group is Transpontane Toxalbum. Uh, potential pomegranate in the Marmara region. My hometown is Bursa, uh, and uh, seed markets sell that as panacea uh, and uh, helps to treat everything uh, you can uh, face. Pseudacase in the Mediterranean region and castor oil plant in the Aegean region. Toxins in this protein structure inhibits the ribosomes and inhibits the protein synthesis. They have uh, usually two polypeptide chains. The first polypeptide chain uh, binds the surface multiple protein for endocytosis, and the second chain uh, binds the 6th subunit of ribosome and inhibits the ribosome and uh, protein synthesis inhibited by this way. Clinic is depends on the route of exposure. Gastrointestinal exposure, uh, present with abdominal pain and diarrhea, it's necessary to achieve and break the seed of the uh, plant because otherwise intoxication will not be uh, will not develop. Inhalation exposure is more dangerous because it has high mortality rates and also localized pulmonary effects can be observed. When a toxin makes the system, uh, the multi-organ failure is inevitable. Uh, treatment, we have no chance uh, other than aggressive supportive treatment because there is no known cure for this toxicity. Antiracinal antibodies have some studies, but the results are not very hopeful uh, for this reason. We have just supportive therapy in this toxicity. Thank you for your patience. Okay, I want to thank for the presentation, Mr. Karajabai. Uh, I want to take a question in, in Salon, but I want to apologize for foreigner uh, colleges. Uh, I know there are medical students in here, and I want to uh, take a Turkish version of the question uh, for medical students. Ben üç konuşmacı da Türkçe biliyor. Özellikle öğrenci arkadaşlarımız var. Onların konuşmasını istiyorum. Üç öğrenci arkadaş üç soru sormadan buradan çıkmayacağız. Onların <gülüyor> katılımını sağlamasını istiyorum. Sinan Bey buraya bir Olur. Evet. Do you have any questions about our speakers? Yes, medical students. You can speak Turkish. Ben seçeceğim ona göre. Seçeyim mi? Evet, siz anlamadınız. Lütfen bir sorar, sorar mısınız? Yok, sizin arkanızda sağlık. Evet, evet. Siz. Evet, bu arkadaşlarımız geleceğin <gülüyor> toksikologları, üretim yönleri. Onlara sesini duymak istiyorduk. Buraya kadar geldik. Merhaba. <gülüyor> Zararı yok efendim, dinleyelim mi sizi? Tabii ki. Ee, Mikrofonunuz kapalı, çağır mısınız? Evet. Peki biz su duyuyoruz efendim, buyurun. Ee, genelde antivenomları çalıştığım devlet hastanesinde Kullanılmadığı için hep tarihi geçmiş e, antrenörler oluyordu ve bunlar değiştirilmiyordu. E, biz aradığımızda hani bir de kullanabilirsiniz deniliyordu. Evet. Biz onları da yapıyoruz. Yes, Mr. Sabah. Türkçe lütfen. Evet. Sonra İngilizce çevirebilirsiniz. Evet, teşekkür ederim. Evet. Bence güzel bir soru. Ee, kullanmak gerekiyor. <gülüyor> tarihi geçmiş kullanmak gerekiyor. Her bölgenin kendine ait antidot merkezi var. Örneğin bir bölgemiz de Güneydoğu, Adana'dır. Adana'da herhangi bir e, antidot ihtiyacınız varsa itibata geçiyorsunuz. Gerekli bir şey ki servise gidiyor bu antidot servise. Ama tarihi geçmiş bir kullanma gerekiyor. Teşekkür ederim. Okay, thanks for the question. Evet, another one o tarafta. En arkadaki arkadaşımız köşedeki. Madem siz sormadınız, ben seçim. Hocam ben bir şey sorsam. Tabii yani, ki. Yani farklı hocalarımız da burada iken açık kadar. Ee, şimdi normalde hani ilaçlar üretilirken belli bir güven aralığı görüyoruz. Yani sol kullanım tarihinden sonra belli bir süre oluyor. Yani antivenomlarda aslında böyle bir şey geçerli olabilir mi? Yani öyle bir şeyimiz yok. Hani bu kadar bir bilgimiz yok tabii ama hani SKT sonrası kullanım normal böyle e, ilaçlarda olduğu gibi tavsiye eden tüketim tarihi. Tabii tavsiye eden tüketim tarihi oluyor aslında. Yani üzerinde belli bir süre şeyimiz oluyor. Kullanma şansımız oluyor aslında. Çalışmalarla belirleniyor. Dolayısıyla hmm. e, bence kullanılmaması 
gerekeceğini düşünüyorum ama işim hocam bir katkısı olur mu? Ben de kutluğumda Türkçe Farmakolog olarak bu sorular bize çok geliyor. Aynı hocam da dediği gibi stabilitesi çok önemli. Özellikle biyolojiklerde, biyolojik ki bunlar bu antivenomlar biyolojik ve protein içeriyorlar. Bunların denatürasyonu o şey, antivenomun etkisinin olmamasına neden olacaktır. Ee, onun için e, tabii ki biz burada expression date yani son kullanma tarihini dikkate almak zorundayız. Dün bana çok ilginç bir soru geldi. Hem de şeyden, 9 Eylül Ağacı'dan hocalardan birisi bana sormuş bir harkin <gülüyor> şey, e, miastan nedrevis ilacı, interferon e, alfayı e, saklarken hasta e, buzdolabı yerine buzluğa atmış. E, buzluğa atmış ondan sonra çözdürmüş. Bunu kullanabilir miyiz, kullanamaz mıyız diye soruyor. Tabii ki kullanamaz çünkü çözüldüğü zaman e, bu, bu proteinler denetri olacaktır. O nedenle burada özellikle biyolojik içeren, diğer kimyasal maddelerin stabilitesi biraz daha uzun sürebilir. Ama özellikle biyolojik e, etken ki son yıllarda ilaçlar biliyorsunuz artık hep biyolojik. Biyolojikleri içeren e, ilaçların kesinlikle son kullanma tarihinden sonra hiçbir şekilde garanti edemeyiz etkinlikleri için ve güvenlikleri için de aynı zamanda. Evet, ortam açıldı arkadaşlar. Yes. Ee, ben 9 Eylül Üniversitesi Tabi Farmakoloji Anabilim Kanalı'nda asistan ekibi. Ee, bize gelen bir vaka vardı. Sirken olsa Türkiye'den iki tane anne ve kız. Haçlayı yemişler. Sonrasında e, halüsinasyonlar, e, böyle nöbet takip etkileri olmuştu. E, annesi yoğun bakımda e, kaldırılmıştı. Kızı da kapıda annesi beklerken e, efektif nöbet geçirmişti. Bize artık oyun alışkı sendrom düşündük diyerek danıştılar ama e, midrası dışında hani artık oyun alışkı sendrom destekleyecek bir bulgusu yoktu bu anne kızı. Biz şunu sormak istiyoruz, yani bu bitkilerle ilgili verilere nereden ulaşabiliriz, nereden araştırabiliriz? Belli bir kaynak ee, Şimdi şöyle aslında dünkü toplantıda şey konuşuldu, hani Amerika'da çok ciddi bir database var ve orada e, bir botanikçi bu konuyla alakalı fikir veriyor. Aslında bitkilerle alakalı tatlım bilgiye bizim hayır olmak mümkün değil. Yani botanikçi olmak gerekiyor çünkü bunun için. Ee, hani seçeneğiniz varsa, hani botanikçi varsa ki üniversitede vardır muhakkak, hani onlardan destek almak en mantıklısı. Yoksa semptomatik olarak ellemeniz lazım. Hani bahsettiğiniz semptomlar zaten çok antikolinerjik şeye uymuyor, toksidrama uymuyor. Hani çok olası değil bence antikolinerjik seyirlenme ama bitkinin tam, tam tanımlanabilmesi için bir e, botanikçiden bir şey almak gerekir muhakkak, görüş almak gerekir. Yani öyle bir şey yok, database'imiz yok. Hani bu bitki şudur, yani görsel işte, işte yani Google görsel aramalarını başlattı ama çok yeterli sonuç vermez. Hani belki o kullanılabilir ama çok daha primitif düzeyde ilerliyor aslında onların görsel araması. Ki bence işe yarayacak bir şey olacaktır bunlarla alakalı. Ama e, tam türlü tanımlayabilmek adına bir botanikçiden muhakkak görüş almak gerekir. Benim sorum tam olarak toksikoloji ile ilgili değil belki ama e, psikolojinin mantarının e, aynı zamanda psikiyatrik hastalıkların tedavisinde kullanıldığını düşünüyorum. Özellikle Amerika'da bu konu hakkında neler söyleyebiliriz hocam? Aslında psikolojinin içeriğinde psikolojinin içeriyor ve hani toksitesi düşük bir mantar. Ve e, yani kötü kullanımı da var. E, genellikle hani ülkelerde zaten kullanımı e, kısıtlanmış durumda bu mantarın. Hani bazı ülkelerde e, hani bunun satışı yapılabiliyor. E, ama e, aynı şekilde tıbbi mantarların, yani daha doğrusu bu şekilde e, doğal mantarların tıbbi tedavide kullanımı da hani e, bazı hastalıklar açısından hani başlatılmış neticede bu da serotonin reseptörleri üzerinden hani etki eden bir şey olduğu için hani depresyon gibi hastalıklarda hani kullanılabilir ama yani neticede kötüye kullanımı olan da bir şey yani bunların tabii ki kullanıma geçmeden önce e, çok detaylı e, klinik öncesi çalışmaların, <gülüyor> klinik çalışmalarının yapılması gerekiyor yani böyle e, bu şekilde bununla ilgili tıbbi mantarların e, tedavide kullanımı ile ilgili Çalışmalar hatta bununla ilgili dergiler de var sadece tıbbi mantarların işte kullanımı ile ilgili ama hani e, şu an hani bildiğim kadarıyla kanıtlanmış bir şey yok çalışmalar var e, onlar da tabii ki zaman istiyor. Teşekkür ederim. Peki. Şimdi oradan bir soru alacağım. Orka tarafta bir soru istiyorum.
Bir de oradan bir soru hakkınız var. Bir soruyla bitireceğim hocam. Buyurun. Hocam merhabalar öncelikle ben Yeteren Kalın, Perden 8 Üniversitesi 1. sınıf öğrencisiyim. Ne güzel, hoş geldiniz. Çok teşekkür ederim. Asıl biz teşekkür ederiz sizlere misafir ettiğinizden dolayı. Hocam benim sorum iki sorum var ama zaten birbiriyle bağlantılı. Birincisi burada son Sinan hocamız da yanılmıyorsam bir bitkilerden bahsettiniz ve orada şey hani bitkilerde bu işte toksikolojik vakalara sebep olacak toksinlerin içermesine. Benim sorum burada şu, hani bu bitkilerin yani tamamen mi toksikolojik yoksa belli bir doz aşımından sonra mı bu meydana geliyor? Bu bir. ikinci durumsa mesela e, burada yazmıştım siyanit mekanizmasında işte oksidatif fosforilasyonun baskılanması tret döngüsünün durdurulmasından bahsetmiştiniz. Şimdi bu bitkiler de zaten oksidatif fosforilasyon yapıyorlar. Hani burada e, yani geliştirilecek olan ilaçlarda ya da antidotlarda bir Zaten bitkiler de bu aynı bizdeki mekanizmanın benzerleri bulunduğu için antidot geliştirmelerde böyle bir mekanizm üzerinden çalışmalar var mı? Teşekkür ediyorum. Şimdi şöyle senin e, sorduğun sorunun bir bilim dalı var fitoterapi diye eczacı fakültelerinde. Yani hani bitkilerin e, medikal faydalarının kullanımıyla alakalı. Tabii ki hani e, aslında bu parasal sözün sözü bitkiler için de geçerli. Yani hani her şey e, zehirde belirleyen dozudur. Şimdi mesela yani sinojenik bileşiklerde en çok karşımıza çıkma ihtimali olan şey olduğu için söylüyorum. Yani herkes muhakkak bir kaysa çekirdeği falan. Hani kurutup bilindir, güzel bir keyifli de bir şeydi. Ee, bunu e, kullanım miktarıyla alakalı bir şey. Yani tamamen. Çünkü detoksifikasyon şeyin var, yolağın var. Hani vücutta her şeyle alakalı bir detoksifikasyon yolağı var. Zaten bunu açtığın zaman problem ortaya çıkıyor. O detoksifikasyon yolağını açtığın zaman problem ortaya çıkıyor. Hani direkt toksik etkili olanlar var. Hani hiçbir şekilde şey yapamayacağım, tölder edemeyeceğim yani ama tefaliyeniz mesela çok düşüktür şey yani hani mantarlarda hani e, direkt toksik etkisi, mütötik inhibitörler e, belli bir şeyden sonra toksik etkisinin önüne geçmem mümkün değil ama her şey doğru alakalı. Vücut zaten yani çok doğal bir güdüyle aslında kendimizi onarmaya çalışıyoruz her şeyde böyle. Hani yaptığımız şey yok. Hani aldığın toksin miktarı evet vücut bir şekilde eksplet edebiliyorsa veya detoksifiye edebiliyorsa birçok detoksifikasyon yolağımız var. Hani bunlardan herhangi birisini detoksifik etme yolu bulabiliyorsa zaten problem yok. Ancak her detoksifikasyon senin vücudunu hasar yapıyor. Olay aslında bundan kaynaklı yani hani sonuçta ömür dediğimiz çizginin bitiş sebebi aslında bu yani detoksifikasyon yolaklarımızın tükenmesinden kaynaklı aslında. Peki hocam o bahsettiğim ilaç geliştirme yolaklarından yani bitkilerde de aynı mekanizma olduğundan dolayı o bahsettiğiniz antidotlar da böyle bir özütten mi elde ediliyor yoksa yani en azından böyle bir mekanizmanın da bir bağlantı var mı? Yani bitki biyolojisiyle e, mesela o zehirli şeyler onlarda da bulunuyor biliyorsunuz. Diyelim o işte kreps döngüsünü engelleyen hani bizde engelleyip onlarda da engellememesinin sebebini oradan bir antidot olarak elde ediliyor. Bir de bunu sormak istemiştim. Şimdi şöyle... E, ya da bunun bir mekanizmasını biliyorsunuz yani. Ya yani. bir örneğe gidelim. Amigdeli zaten hani o bitkinin kendi yapısında bulunan bir şey. Yani siyanöre dönüşmüyor zaten. Biz bunu aldığımızda vücudumuz bunu siyanöre metabolize ediyor. Yani sen vücudunu aldığın zaman doğal olarak yani gastrointestinal sistemden girdiğinde yani ekspor ortaya çıktığında enteropatik sürpriz'e giriyor. O enteropatik sürpriz'in temel mantığı zaten metabolize ediyor. Bunu yani sen sana enerji elde etmek için, detoksif etmek için fark etmez gerekirsin oldu. Enteropatik sürpriz alıyorsun sen bunu. Bu sürpriz'e girdiği zaman bir metabolik ortaya çıkıyor. Atıyorum parasitimolde de bu böyle. Hani sadece şey için değil, gitti için değil. Hani sen bunu vücudunu uzaklaştırma ve etkin metabolik ortaya çıkarmaya çalışırken toksik metabolik ortaya çıkarıyor. Tamamen vücudun metabolizması ile alakalı. Teşekkür ediyorum. Peki, e, anayı da yemeyelim. Başka soru olur. Okey, e, süre doldu galiba. Okey, I want to thank you for all of our press uh, speakers and listeners and I want uh, to close this direct. Uh, thanks again. Uh, let's break off.